The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. Don't you want to sound rich? Welcome to a special crossover episode of One Nation Radio and Keeping It Strong Style. Jeremy Dobbin here with Rich Latta and James Boyd. Unfortunately, the young boy Josh Smith is uh, sick, could not uh, make the booking tonight. So uh, I'll be holding it down for the the Keeping It Strong Style. You know, it's like New Japan, you know, the, the top stars dwindle every forbidden door, so you only, you only got one, uh, you know, New Japan top star this evening. <laughs> <laughs> is he okay? is he, I didn't know what Josh was on here. Is he okay? Because, like, I figured, you know, he'd be a little healthier given all the rest he was catching up on last night. Yeah, uh, I know. We all got a, a nice lecture uh, last night about, you know, staying up, watching the pay-per-view, not getting enough sleep. And, you know, now what about it now? <laughs> So, uh, all so I can before, think is that this man is, is so anti AEW. This man was like, absolutely the fuck not. I'm, I'm, not <laughs> I'm not talking about this shit. So I'd have to look it up, but like, how many New Japan shows has he ever been better than the show uh, that happened on Sunday? Right, we we don't need to you know get into all that now. You know? We don't need to talk <laughs> about the past. I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. So like, I, I really like Russell Kingdom, but like, I have I've been in and out. So, like, was there, like, a New Japan Cup show so far? Like, you know there's going to be, like, an Osaka G1 show that's going to be one of the best shows of the year, like, always. Yeah. So, I, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to be funny. I was being, being dead serious. Yeah, I mean, Windy City Riot was a really good show. Um, that's right. That's right. New be- some of the New Beginning stuff. You had uh, the Sabre Brian match uh, in February. There was also the uh, New Beginning with the Dog Pound Cage match, United Empire. It was three New Beginnings this year, right? Yeah, I think so. The... Which okay, so that was the was that the first or the second one? The Saber Brian match. Yeah, uh, I think it was the second one. I, I'd have to go to Cage match and, and see. I watched that match. I love that match. I'm just saying, like, as long as that show, that match, and I'm not misremembering things, it's not on the same show as like that that second Sonata in uh, Naito match. And yeah, I, I'm I'm with you. Whatever you're saying, then. Yeah, because. Mm. <laughs> so uh, before Battle we get started, I just wanted to give a shout oh, yeah, out. Oh yeah, yeah, Battle and uh, Valley, yeah. Yeah, before we get, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so before we get into it, I just want to give a shout out to technic, uh, to uh, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, uh, technological racism. Like I, one of the reasons why it took me so long to log on is because when I started, I was wearing uh, a lavender color shirt, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, lavender color shirt. So uh, when I wear light, because I'm I, I'm dark skin, so whenever I wear a lighter color shirt, like the color doesn't find my face and it in the and apparently the face is the light ass shirt because they think it's white skin or something so it made me it makes me darker so <laughs> i just want to show you so i, I just want to show you let, let's show you a little trick watch watch this <laughs> <laughs> all of it now now it's gone no. oh oh it finds my face now so shout out to technological racism so that, that's all i wanted to say um you gotta set you up the lights man it's not the lights because there's enough light on me right now magically that's true i wear a, i wear a light ass shirt then all of a sudden I, they can't find me so yeah <laughs> all right well uh we are here to review forbidden door so we'll we'll jump into it we'll start from the zero hour work our way down to the main event we'll talk about uh, Wrestle Dynasty officially. I know uh, some people were here uh, on the chat before we officially hit record here, but uh, so we'll talk more about Wrestle Dynasty here. So let's start off with the zero zero hour. So first up, we had uh, Kyle Fletcher defeating Serpentico, three minutes ten seconds. So you know, quick squash match. Uh, nice way to get Kyle Fletcher on the show after losing the 
ROH TV title to Atlantis Jr. in, in Mexico this past week. But besides that, I mean, did y'all have any thoughts about, about that one? So I, I figured that was a sick joke from Tony Khan. Who, like, I've seen all these people uh, complaining about, you know, 14 matches on this show. Well, guess what? Here's one more for y'all ass, you know, for the road. <laughs> Holla. <laughs> uh, I didn't think about that, but that's funny. Uh, I, I will say, like, it reminded me of, like, the old NXT days when it's like, oh, somebody just lost on TakeOver. Very next uh, show, someone gets their win back. Um. So really quickly in the squash fashion, like a lot of Shayna Baszler ish type of thing. So yeah, I uh, um, I thought it was satisfactory for what it was. Yeah. Uh, following that, we had Kings of the Black Throne, Brody King and Malachi Black defeating the teams of Gabe Kidd and Roderick Strong, Kyle O'Reilly and Tomohiro Ishii, and Private Party in eight minutes and thirty nine seconds. So uh, I enjoyed a lot of the cross matches. It felt very watching this show. You include what was on the main car with the trios match with the Young Bucks and Okada with the acclaimed and Tanashi. A lot of this felt like typical road to style stuff of showing you interactions um, between in- individuals and you want to see certain matches play out. Like I know Brody King and Ishii have wrestled before. I want to see it again. This was fun. This is very fun. Now, I would like Ishii not to, you know, try to kill uh, uh, Brody Kimo, drop him on his head. But outside of that, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought for what they were doing, I thought they got their points across very well. Yeah, I was um, talking about this in a pre-show. But I So, like, when Malachi Black and Brody King come out, uh, they're their own thing. Like, they're their own team inside the unit. So, like, it was some music that I didn't recognize. And I was like, who the fuck is this? Like, and then um, I see them. I was like, oh, I know who's not losing this match. Like, I didn't know about winning, but I know who damn sure wasn't losing. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, a lot of cool stuff. See, seeing Gabe Kidd uh, get, you know, into the, the AEW galaxy, if you will, is like hilarious just because Gabe, I find Gabe Kidd to be an unserious individual who like has no idea like it's like he has no home training essentially so it's like, <laughs> can't be trusted like during the match i was like this man is acting like the white bad news brown like he's a threat to walk out on his own team all that shit one thing that he reminds me of you know how people always will say like in mma like kobe covington is like conor mcgregor except he doesn't know how to actually promote. he's just an idiot mm-hmm. like that's what I get the vibes off of, of, of Gabe Kidd. Like, he doesn't actually know what he's just doing. He's just being an asshole because he thinks that'll pop people. But he's also turning people off at the same time. He doesn't, But he doesn't really get it yet. And, like, I'm going to see how this is going to turn to how he matures over time. Or if he doesn't, and he's going to be where he is. Uh, but he's obviously very talented. Uh, and I, I did find it very funny. He's chopping the shit out of, out of O'Reilly. And then, like... <laughs> And Roddy's getting it, so he's like, "No, I'm chopping my friend. You, <laughs> you, you, you. That's my friend. I can chop him." I, so I thought that was funny. That, that, that amused me. Um, Ishii was walking out, and he got a he got a huge pop. And I'm like, "This guy is still over. Like, like people Always. still treat this man like he should have been much higher on the card." And uh, not everyone gets to come here, as evidenced by the obvious absences. Uh, <laughs> but Ishii is here all the time, and um he's so appreciated by by the american audience yes yeah this was a, a really fun matchup this is like i feel like the, the real spirit of forbidden door is kind of having these mashups and people together that you norm- normally don't see together and i like the fact of you know ishii being friends of orange cassidy and kyle being friends of or- orange cassidy you, you got the uh conglomeration all kind of flowing from that and so yeah overall a really fun matchup uh, again you can mention ishii Really great reactions. Really scary spot there towards the end where uh, they did the chasing the dragon uh, double team combo and Ishii dropped uh, Brody King right on his head with the brain buster portion of that. But it seems like he was all right, got up, finished the spots. But yeah, real fun. I know uh, you mentioned James. There are some people who are are turned off by Gabe Kidd. I don't know, man. I see uh, star potential all over that. I know some people are, you know, they they think it's gimmick. They don't like the gimmick. They think he's, you know, too overbearing. But I don't know. I enjoy it. Just he's. He's a loose cannon, unpredictable, uh, and great in the ring. So I don't know. I, I'm feeling Gabe Kid. Yeah, I. 
it, the mileage varies on him. Sometimes I do find him grading. So I can see where people are coming from when they're like, oh, God. So I'm just like, it, this can change over time. This can get better. He's what he's going to have to. He's gonna have to re- know when to reel in. It's like, like for example, uh, when Tekla first came to start him, like she was over the top of the top, and then she reeled it in, and she found a nice, a nice place where she was in, in Donald Armando. Like he has time. He's young. He's very talented. Like I think, I think he'll he'll make he'll modulate uh, depending on his audience. Like because you know some of that stuff is like it, it screams like Chet William or sorry Chet Hanks cussing. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with that, like, like it's, it's 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 like oh okay man it's it's please cut cut me some slack yeah uh zach wow. said uh qu- quit, quit the brawling <laughs> i start actually gary, wrestling gary owens a pro wrestling my god um, <laughs> oh man but yeah so uh nice opening match up there got some guys in the car that need to be there uh next up here we had a, a james boyd offer match we had Tam Nakano and Willow Nightingale defeating Chris Statlander and Momo Watanabe 10 minutes and 18 seconds. Yeah, very good match. Very effective match. Uh, got over that they're selling this Statlander and Willow uh, match as a as more than just uh, one little singles match. This will be a continuation even past uh, the match they will be having uh, coming up shortly. And um, I thought that uh, Tam and Momo played well with uh, their teammates, especially Tam and Willow, uh, Momo with the uh, with the B driver or awful waffle over here uh, on um, on Willow. I thought that was impressive, and like I, you know, I thought that Tam did very well selling early and then building up what she normally does when she wrestles moving much bigger than her. Which is like I can't suplex this person. I'm going to get to the yeah. I'm going to do my Hogan Andre thing and eventually get the big suplex. Um, did it twice. Got the big or uh, you know did it once. Got the uh, Twilight Dream suplex on Momo. I was hoping to see the the the, the uh, violet sorry uh, the violet screwdriver, but you know I, I think that's 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 a bit much for and for a pre show match. Like you pull out the super finisher where you drop someone straight down and ninety <laughs> degree angle. On their head. So I, you know, so I, I see why they went with that one, but it was still impressive nonetheless. Yeah, um, the styles kind of blended seamlessly here. I think um, the crowd may have been like less familiar with um, Tam and Momo, and I think they both did a good job to kind of show like what they bring to the table. I think the sequence where Willow and Momo got paired off at the end, and they were just like yeah. making that shit sound off. I think that got over uh, in the building. Yeah, Obviously, the, 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 the big kicks and then the, and then the set of the pounce. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, you know, uh, stardom or pin stardom are here. So like, yep. there's no, uh, you know, like there's a, uh, it is real clean. And like, yep. I, I couldn't imagine, you know, people being angry with this, but somehow I imagine someone is somewhere, but, um, I, I thought, you know, as far as like the alignments, like you found the perfect person to kind of, uh, slot in to be stat Leonard's partner here, uh, yes. with, with Momo. So yes. like props to whoever put that together. Yes, hey. props to whoever put that together. Um, now, yeah, speaking of Momo, uh, it's like the same Momo Watanabe that I remember last time I was watching Stardom. <laughs> oh, oh, so last time, checked, last time you checked, was what? She was still in. Uh, she was still in Queen's Quest, right? Well, yeah, I, I knew she had turned heel and like left and right. joined away Otai. But the, it's, the, the look, the look change is very stark, isn't it? The go from 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 like, you know, looking how she looked to all of a sudden she has this like this this. Almost like uh, uh, what's your boy's name from Noah? Um, uh, what does it matter? But like the the super blonde out, almost like the uh, Takiyama hair, and then like the yellow contacts is like she almost looks jaundiced in a way. <laughs> like she looks, she looks, full, she looks fully evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely a tremendous transformation over these past uh, few years that hey, I have not man. enjoyed because she's you know she's awesome in like she's she's over there. You know, she's like she's like Dookie in at the end of Wire. Like she's out there with with uh, with the trash man shooting heroin. I I hate it. I hate it for her. I did not I did not expect this when I started watching. I did not want her, this to be her life. This is where she is. <laughs> I hate it. Yeah, yeah. It's not, not the mumbo. I remember that when we were in uh, New York, 2019, for mm-hmm. the uh, Stardom show. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's different. <laughs> yeah. yeah, white belt champion. Uh, she was promoted as the future ace, uh, and you know. It, it, it didn't. It didn't work. Away. It, the future didn't come in that in that way that we expected it. Like she's still awesome. Like she's still gonna. You know, when she's in the in the Grand Prix, she still lights it up. Um, but 
it just she's been in Oedo Tai, and Oedo Tai's been, you know, it's had its moments. It's been better since NASCO came back from her knee injury, but like it's still, you know, it's still if it's not Momo or at the point when before Starlight Kid left or got kicked out, exiled, it was like it was just a it, it's it's very mixed bag. And you know when NASCO's in there, you you don't know what you're gonna get. I, I will say she has been better since she came back uh, about a year ago. Yeah, uh, nice little match. Yeah, uh, we had a question here from Dev Triangle Seven Twenty. He says to O and R, what could be the benefits of having NJPW owning Stardom? Sorry, say again. He said, "What's the the benefits of having NJPW owning Stardom?" So now it's official that uh, New Japan. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe they'll get a better booker. Mm. Um, like Tyro Okada has been on fraud alert. Like he's good. He's fine as far as booking, um, the day to day, you know, road to level shows, but he does not appear as of yet since he's had this book now for five months to know how to to book towards big programs or book towards somebody uh, triumphing. And that was the thing for stardom was every year there was a new breakout star slash somebody getting their title run, you know, finish the stories type type thing. And it don't look like none of them are, are across the horizon. None of them are being set up. And then when some look like they're set up, they completely flip on you and you're like, huh, what? And um, right now they're in the middle of booking tragedies like, you know, um, Starlight Kid was in the middle of, you know, being a successful wrestler in a, one of the two successful wrestlers in El Tai, and they kicked her out of, out of group. And now she's searching for to find a unit still. Um, they just broke up Oedo Tai or sorry, Oedo Tai just beat Queen's Quest and just basically disbanded the whole group, split them up like the Lions in the Voltron and kept Kamatani with the namesake and everybody else is out. That's a tragedy. I don't enjoy watching tragedies without <laughs> anything on the back end to, over, to to make up for the fact that we had a majority of tragedy. So uh, you know, it's it's been it's been a, a weird few months. Also, they were setting up a, a Nasu Poi and uh, Ano I white belt match, and then they had Mika Owada, who never wins anything anywhere in any other judge promotion, win the fucking white belt off of a. Uh, off of Ano, and it's like, okay, so that match that you teased for months, then said, then literally had Ano cut a promo after one of her most recent defenses, saying, "I need you to wait a little bit longer," which is like, we're going to wait and set this up for a big match because we have this long history as frenemies before Stardom, and also in Stardom, and also in Cosmic Angels now to get to this particular semi-main event level match for some big show down the line post the Grand Prix, it's up in smoke now because it is gave the belt to someone in Sendai Girls who never wins a goddamn thing that matters. And it's like wh- what is happening here? It's it's a lot of it's it's been it's been really strange um what they've been setting up. Like the only really consistent thing they have going for them right now is like they always have they always have solid defenses, always have solid champions. Uh, but like Mayu's IWGP women's title run, like that's been the, that's been the saving grace of like, this is still the stellar stardom from, you know, when I started watching all the way through and, um, you know, the rest is like, they're, it looks like they're setting up these things, but then they're like, okay, so it's not getting paid off. All right. So now I'm with him. It, it's been, it's been frustrating that way. From a fan. From a, yeah. I was, was going to say from a fan perspective, I kind of struggle to, to see where, the benefit of new Japan owning stardom is like, if you're just like, yo, how does this enhance the fan experience? Like maybe like, you know, in the, in the office or, you know, less uh, redundancy or uh, it's a little bit easier. It, it, all stuff that fans don't like, uh, actually like consume. Like, so like, I, I'm trying to think right now and I'm like, all right, like, yeah, they can already do crossovers without new Japan straight owning them. So, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, their, their schedules, like, like maybe the new Japan has like, uh, you know, better promotional, uh, aspects. So, but you know, they were already under Bushi road anyway. So, you know, as far as like turning people into bigger stars, you know, put them on billboards, maybe, maybe that's like what you're looking at. 
yeah, like you're saying, Rich, I, do, I definitely think there's going to be almost like a uh, quote unquote TKO kind of part of this where they're going to probably maybe downsize a little bit and combine offices, combine resources. So like there's going to be a behind the scenes, there's probably going to be a lot of benefits for them there. I think probably the biggest benefit, like you mentioned, is probably this is a scheduling because there has been there have been conflicts when it comes to you know trying to get the IWGP Women's Title on a show and the New Japan Strong Women's Title on a show in Japan. So there's been a lot of kind of booking issues because obviously there's both shows are running tours all the time, and so I think now with having a same office and more communication, it seems like that there's going to be a better shot of getting more maybe IWGP women's title matches on new Japan shows, maybe more new Japan strong women's matches with stardom women involved, maybe saying more stardom women to uh, strong pay reviews in the U S maybe that's kind of the, their plan. I was yeah. hoping maybe we can send some men to stardom, you know, <laughs> just the equal rights going on, you know, like, there have no, been men in stardom get, before like we, Kota we need, Ibushi and Omega. So we need them back, you know, you know we, we, we Dr. Need, Dr. Wagner jr. We we, uh, we we need them on the you know second match on the show you know the the, the men's offer match you know the men's offer put them match. in the uh, no the buffer spot right before you know main event <laughs> yeah <laughs> house of torture yeah well whoever the booker is like regardless of whoever it is like if whoever it is they need to come in their first acts need to be a hey, Tam Nakano Mayu Watani Shuri one of y'all need to come in here and job for Micah Micah's mm-hmm. been a very good champion but you have not given her a single threatening challenger in this whole run, except for Kamatani, who was clearly going to lose. So um, that would be a thing like give the, give the top title a, a, a interesting challenger. That would be something. Yeah. You would think a lot of people in the comments, give men a chance. Hashtag the men's revolution. Don't don't Josh. say that. Hey man, say that when I'm not here when Josh is. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So uh, moving on to the next match, we had a Owen Hart Foundation Women's Tournament quarterfinal match. We had Mariah May defeating Soraya in eight minutes and 31 seconds. Yeah, I mean, it. I was more intrigued by the stuff around the match with the interference in the in, you know, Tony in the in the 2018 or 17 stardom track suit and everything. Um, in in uh, Harley Cameron around and all that kind of stuff. Like the, this was a this was a Gaga match. I mean, some or to some extent, but um, you know, like <laughs> this is one of the better Soraya matches we've gotten in AEW. So like, I have to give it a thumbs up. I guess. I guess. Not two thumbs up, but a good one. Like, yay! It didn't suck. It wasn't awful. <laughs> Yeah, this was uh, you know, we we all kind of knew this was coming from a couple of weeks ago. Everybody was kind of baffled um, that they did that loss um, for Mariah May before, which I assume is going to be her her last loss for quite a while. Um, you know, it, it, looking at it from an outside perspective, why they do these things, you know, it's hard to get people to to lose matches in, in this company. It's not a secret, so it's like. You beat me, I'll beat you. You know, blah, blah, blah. Like, and I think that some of that stuff gets reflected in, in you know, things like this. Not saying like I don't have any information of someone not wanting to lose to somebody, but I could imagine, it, you know, if you come to the table with, hey, we're gonna do fifty fifty between you guys, you know, it's a lot easier to sell than just, hey, you're jobbing. So I don't know. Yeah, I, don't, I think it added a little bit of intrigue because I think most people are kind of expect Mariah to win the first match because she's the one getting pushed right now, and Soraya has kind of been on and off TV. So I think getting Soraya the upset win on TV does kind of help build some more intrigue for this match to so just being kind of a cold match. And, of course, they had to kind of protect Soraya here at the end with yeah. uh, Mariah kind of get a, a roll-up finish here. But, uh, you know, Mariah clearly a star, and, you know, she kind of had to work down to uh, Soraya's level here. Uh, but... She got the win. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, what the Wembley plans are going to be, that uh, Mariah's probably winning this thing, going to face Tony Storm. And so I think the, the well, next step is going to be pretty interesting. Possibly, you know, but maybe, maybe you know, Toro Okada says swerve you, you know, and give you something that make, don't make not much sense. So we'll <laughs> see. <laughs> uh, so then the main event of the Zero Hour, we had some good old R. LPW Mystico and the Lucha Brothers. They defeat Los Ingobernables de Japón, Hiromu Titan, and Yota Suji in 12 minutes and one second. 
Man, as a, uh, you know, someone that is very um, adept in in assessing ROPW, um, yeah, man, this is, uh, it, it ain't never once not got over. <laughs> so more people should try it, honestly. <laughs> um, lots of Lucha Libre. It was, it was very cool to see, Miss, the, look, the Mr. Bros, uh, I guess we can call them that. <laughs> um you know, the, <laughs> all the masks, man. I, I just think about all the money that could have been made with all, with all the masks. Like, can you can you can you sell the the, the triple mask of, of all those guys? Um, knowing AEW, they they completely whiffed on that. But um, <laughs> yeah, as far as like, I was looking for a little bit more from Yoda Suji. Um, I, I think if you're somebody that is kind of looking, like, okay, who's who's this guy? Like, I don't think you got. Um, half of what he could do so hopefully he gets another you know opportunity uh to come through but i, I thought this thing was really cool i thought her was excellent uh unintentional comedy god and um ray phoenix just bro when i see ray phoenix i'm like tell me this guy isn't the greatest luchador ever like he's so great like like and, and just the way that uh the way that he, that he and his brother are marketed i think they're like these i don't know like it's like all right man yeah we know they're awesome like that that's almost to the extent of it but it's like hey man i think we need to focus on like we need to start preserving these guys and pushing them and i've done this rant before on one nation radio like we need to like start referring to these guys as legends like knowing what they've done in in their careers and shit like that it's like I, i you know like Phoenix is another level. Like he just is. Yeah, Pentagon and Phoenix are great. I think it's kind of crazy that they have not main evented a pay per view in some shape or form, whether it be some kind of big tag match or a big singles match. I mean, Pentagon is super charismatic. I, I think that at, at the right timing, the right push, I feel like he could definitely be an AW uh, World Champion contender. And I don't know why the book kind of hasn't really gone that way um, from the since he's been there. Uh, but yeah, obviously super talented. Yeah, very cool seeing them team with Mystico here. And yeah, I know a lot of people um, we were in a group chat kind of mentioning that they want to see more from Suji. And Suji's incredible. And this obviously wasn't, I don't think, that the Suji showcase here. And, um, you know, he has a G1 coming up, and I'm sure he probably wanted to protect himself coming up for that. But if you, if you haven't seen Suji, I definitely recommend going and watch his stuff. He had a great... New Japan Cup final match with um, Hiroki Goto. He had um, his debut match against Sonata. That was great. He's had a lot of really great um, showings um, the past year since he's debuted on the uh, quote-unquote main roster of New Japan. He's definitely going to be a guy to watch out. He's my favorite in the B block right now to be in one of those top three spots um, advancing. Hey, night one, him and Takeshita. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. Yeah, I'm... <laughs> So obviously I'm in agreement with like the level of wrestlers that Pentagon and Phoenix are as singles or as trios or as tags. Uh, I just think they need a storyline put behind them as a rallying as a, to, for people to rally behind because, you know, they've they're they're in that situation like Nick Jackson where it's like, yeah, we'll love to see them have a singles match. But we know what the outcome is if they're in a singles match, they're going to lose if it's not if somebody that's a, you know, they're not in a tag feud with. So. I think that's a I think that's a issue they're gonna have and a hurdle they're gonna have to overcome, and to, to get a groundswell of support to, to kind of re- reignite those fires. People, you know, wanting to see them at a certain at a higher level than their position they already currently are. Um, I think you know I think they're um, emeritus status in AEW. Plug them, play. They're always gonna be over. They're always gonna have the crowd into them. Whatever they do. Uh, so from that perspective, they are AEW legends. Uh, but if you but you know, it's. It's kind of hard right now at this time with the level of talent they have at the top and also on the injury, on the de- on disabled list, whatever, if you will, like to be like, yeah, I need to push Phoenix or Penta right now this very second when it's like, okay, well, like, is Okada incoming? I'm sorry, is Omega incoming? Uh, so it's it's one of those things. Like, at, I think at a time right now with no, no Adam Cole, no – um omega yeah they should be you know put into like the singles divisions or put back into the tag division whatever else but 
maybe you know with the young bucks being the tag champions is that really the best thing to do another to do a more another addition to their feud to the legendary robbery um i don't know i, I but i think like I feel that they should always be in some contention for some type of gold because that's the level of wrestlers they are. And as you mentioned, like, you know, Penta's one of the most charismatic wrestlers ever. And like Ray Phoenix ain't all that far behind. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a, just a, they just got too much talent. They just got too much talent for their own good. And this is how you end up with like, Hey, Jay White wasn't on the show at all. FTR wasn't on the show at all. Mm. Those are some great fucking wrestlers, you know? That, that that's the that's the murderer's role you got to do it to get on a show like this a joint show at, at that too so yeah um you're going to end up with very talented people on pre-shows or not at home or or at home so yeah yeah i uh, had a question from rambo and slam pig says do you expect to see appearances from the lucha brothers in japan or was the multi-man at forbidden door more of a one-off kind of thing uh, I mean, the rumors are that they are, I mean, they've been rumored to be coming into Japan. Pentagon mentioned in that interview a couple of weeks ago that he's been um, not working in AAA to do something that he's wanted to do for a while. So right now it seems like all signs are World Tag League for Lucha Bros. I'd love it. It gave me a sense to actually watch World Tag League for the first time ever. And, uh, and also, <laughs> like, there was there was post, post-match post smoke between Penta and, and Suji. So I, would like to, so I would like to see, like, you know, and also the way, like, they they I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. The way that they hold uh Hiromu like he was like he was like little bro, like there, there's gotta be something to that. And because that seemed strategic and like Hiromu was down to do it too. So it's it has to be something up. Yeah, we can probably see that few continuing in Mexico and Japan. But yeah, getting them in World Tag League would be great. Uh Suji was in World Tag League last year with Sandra Khan Jr. So maybe we can uh extend that feud there with that tag team, but uh, really hoping, yeah, we do see, you know, come November that Lucha Bros are one of the teams announced for the, the tag league. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. like, you think about it, it's November's like, that's around, that's kind of the classic time. They're, they don't have to be, like, think of what we, think of what could possibly be the end of the year for what could be the, the super loaded uh, kind of the classic. Like, they won't be needed necessarily because, like, they weren't in it last year. This expo- and you, you think about it, it should be more loaded this year. With Hangman coming back, Omega coming back, Adam Cole potentially being back. I wouldn't put Adam Cole in there, but, you, but he, there's an option to put him in there. MJF. At MJF going to duck out of that <laughs> thing, but sure. <laughs> uh, Doc asks, was the LIJ versus Lucha Bros, Mr. Cole, the best pre-show match ever? No. 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 There, no. there, there was a no. match, uh, Revolution 2022, I believe. Uh, it was like four and a half. It was like uh, Pack. Um, they brought in Eric Rowan for it. Um, and he, oh, and he substituted. Yeah. Do you remember that match? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, wasn't it? Uh, wasn't it? Um, oh my god. It was uh, House it, of Black. It was House of Black versus versus like Penta Phoenix or some one of the two of the three from um Death Triangle. from Death Triangle plus Rowan. Yeah, yeah, like that one. I remember being like four and a half, and we were in the building for that. Um, yeah. And there's there's a lot of great uh, pre-show matches, but you know I, I wouldn't say this was like on that level, but it was like you know the vibes were immaculate and like just seeing like you can't ask for you can't ask yeah. for a better pre-show match. Like this was it. Yeah, I mean Mystico was out here doing big bumps. Uh, I thought he was out in Arena Mexico. He took the uh, Hiromu uh, Sunset Bomb to the outside, and uh, Hiromu had a lot of energy. I know a lot of people were not uh, very thrilled with the Hiromu Mystico match last week in Arena Mexico. So that Hiromu was kind of you know, more haha uh, in Mexico, but uh, he turned up here uh, on Forbidden Door and Mystico was ready to go as well. So yeah, really, really fun matchup here. Yeah, he um d- also did a promo like on Collision, like the night before, like Haruma speaks like more English than I assumed. And like, is he's fucking hilarious. Like in whether it's physical comedy or like the stuff he's saying, like I could easily see him like one day being like, all right, I'm about to I'm about to make this transition to uh American TV. He could easily do it. Just yeah. like in a way like Akira Tozawa kind of caught on and I know when you think of Akira Tozawa it's like fuck, they use him like this comedy joke guy and and they hit everything he could do. I think Hiromu would have a higher ceiling than that. That's just kind of like the archetype I could easily see him fitting into. Yeah. A lot of people in the chat mentioning uh Eddie Kingston versus Tomohiro Ishii from the All Out mm, 2022 okay. uh pre-show. Yeah. I forgot it was a pre-show match. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy, right? 
Uh, well, let's uh, jump into the main card now. So the, the main pay view opened up. We had MJF defeating Hechicero in 9 minutes and 51 seconds. Hey, man. Um, I need Hechicero to, to go ahead and, uh, and make sure he gets his back checked. Um, <laughs> This carry job that uh, <laughs> that he did in <laughs> in this man's town. Well, you know he's he's a wizard, right? He was doing the you know his little. He had to yeah. work, work the magic to you know yeah. carry him. No, nah, I'm playing. Um, but <laughs> I actually I, I like this match. I saw a lot of people down on it. Thought MJF kind of slept walk his way uh, through this thing. Uh, I thought it was fine. Uh, I, I think it was better than the Tanahashi match last year. But and Hezo yeah. Cero is just like incredible like i i want to watch this guy wrestle like all the time he's like it's like he's a rough rider and he'll just fuck you up in just creative innovative ways and like he hits hard as hell and he's not he's like i don't know like i didn't watch much of lucha underground right but i feel like he's like a guy that they they pull out like or like he could have been a Mortal Kombat character. It's like, yeah. By the way, he's like a sub boss for before you uh, fight Shane Sung. You gotta fight this dude that's getting in the temple that plays with fire and shit. You gotta you gotta beat Hezo Cero before you fight Shane Sung. Well, I mean, he is kind of dressed like in an archetypical way to like the executioner. Uh-huh. So I see what you mean. Like he does like a like a Mortal Kombat character slash you know on you know dungeon sex. So yeah. <laughs> Uh yeah, Lord, Lord versus Desmi and Kanemaru. Yeah, that was also a great pre-show match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was it? Wait, wasn't there a uh, wasn't there a bask in our glory? Or uh, sorry, uh, yeah, swerve in our glory versus uh Bishaman match on the pre-show of Forbidden Door for first Forbidden Door. No, no, that was the match. The Desmi and Kanemaru match was. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, okay. Bishamon yeah, faced, that match faced somebody else. Um, I forgot who Bishamon faced on that on that show. Okay. Okay. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Hechicero was uh, awesome here. He's just so fluid in the ring, and like he just does stuff that you don't see all the time. And I love the whole uh, hammerlock spin thing into a backbreaker, and just just the way that he gets in and out of moves and holes. It's just it's it's really captivating. I thought that this showed that like this was a match that MJF had to win, but this was to showcase Hechicero. And I thought that MJF did a very good job of doing the, you know, the his shtick to like show that like, ah, I think I'm playing with this dude next and you know, he's on his ass. Um, and I thought that, you know, they played to the crowd very well. Like when Hedges, when they did all that stuff at the beginning, so Hechicero can build up towards like he mocks the, the Fargo strut and then he does his fireball stuff and does the double middle fingers. I thought it was great. That was great. Um, yeah. Uh, I thought this achieved what it was meant to do. I, I want to see Hechicero more and more and more like uh, on AEW. Uh, like, I, you know, I want to see like, you know, they're going to have a Red Pro match at him and uh, Sabre. And I heard they already had a match. I, I'm going to seek it out to go see it. Yeah, the uh, the CMLL match Dave gave five stars. Uh, so, oh wow! Yeah, I, so uh, okay, rematch is going to be the day before All In for the uh, Rev Pro Anniversary Show. So should be also another uh, great matchup there. Um, and it looks like MJF is like continuing with this uh, this new finish that he has with this Brain Buster. So like people are still like coming around to it to try to you know he's still trying to establish it like it you know he. Did it against Roosh a couple weeks ago. Yep. Everyone yep. kind of like, oh, that was different. And then he, he laid out Adam here. Cole with it when he showed back up. Yeah. Yeah. So I expect that to be uh, more over in time. Yeah. MJF also hit the uh, the Panama Sunrise before hitting the Brain Buster there. So kind of teasing. Yep. Uh, I don't want no references to Adam Cole. <laughs> 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 Ban these niggas for, from looking at each other. You are not allowed to. I, I barely screen. want them in the same buildings. Yeah, <laughs> but look, can we do a brand split for them niggas? Just them two <laughs> separate shows. Oh my gosh! <laughs> like when Brick came out, I was like, "Damn, that mean Adam Cole might be back there." Fuck! <laughs> I, I can't. I don't want no. I don't want no mingling. I want. I, I want all communication stripped away. <laughs> oh man! So uh, following that, we had six man tag action. We had the Elite: Kazuchika Okada, Matthew Jackson, and Nicholas Jackson. Defeating President Ace, Hiroshi Tanahashi, and the acclaim Anthony Bowens and Max Caster in 13 minutes and one second. Man, um, so this is uh, 
kind of a weird match. Uh, I, I thought it was good. I had fun watching it and everything. But, man, I saw Tanahashi struggling. We know that. Yep. Like, yep. we know that. Like, also, we got to do something with the gear situation with, with Tanahashi. Yeah, man. <clears throat> um, it looks crazy. Um, I, I feel like the, the 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 elite has to tap back into – a more dangerous side, especially going into blood and guts. And I don't know if being matched up with the acclaimed is like why they are kind of, you know, doing, you know, the things they're doing right now, but they let Max Caster rap for all the weeks that they cut him off. And, you know, he routinely worked the word bitch into his, his rhyme uh, to play off Okada's bitch thing. Yeah. Um, it was fine or whatever, but, I don't he saw know, he got his, he saw he got his like sleepy Joe Biden line right. You see, I, you see, I, I you slip that in there, right? I did. You peeped there, right? I did. Look, yeah. that man know where he, where he was at on Long he Island. He knew where he was at, and you saw that mustache and that hair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, it like I kind of just want uh the Bucks to kind of be finished with the acclaim, beat them, and move on and to, into like blood and guts territory because I don't know, man. They feel they feel like both of these teams are kind of struggling right now, and Okada's like. You know, him and Tanahashi facing off was, you know, that's timeless. That's cool. You know, everything like that. But, like, it didn't – I don't think it got the reaction that, you know, you would think it would get. Yeah. Young Bucks feel like they are doing their thing and they are taking it real, real easy until a certain amount of time. That's what it feels like. Uh, and I kind of want them to get to something interesting – in their own right, in the same for Okada with the uh, Continental Belt, um, like they gotta they gotta have something big for them besides just like blood and guts in Wembley. I need something in between that or something interesting. Maybe it's an Adam Page thing, but like it needs to it needs to get here because like they're just trading water. Similar to it is at a better higher level in my opinion, but it's similar to the you know. Hi guys, I'm the learning tree. He's like, all right, bro. I need I need you to get to the fucking point now. Like, we get it now. Now, now get to whatever you're getting to. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, the, the strongest man in the promotion had to come out after the match. You know, Bill Firearm had to run off Kazushko Okada. Um, forever protected the 62-year-old wonder, tougher than Brock Lesnar, tougher than leather, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um you know, that sucked. Yeah. <laughs> Tanahashi, yeah, he's, I mean, the ace is one down. Uh, he needs to go to get some stem cell. He, need, he needs to get some of that gas from Billy Gunn because. So uh, the Germany. <laughs> we we, we got to get, we got to get, we got to get Tanahashi an ass. He missing an ass. <laughs> like, he, he, he moves kind of creaky and the knees and everything. And then like the pants keep falling down. I was like, bro, that's cause you ain't like, they're, they're, you ain't, you, what, where are your glutes, sir? I need you. I need you to, I need you to, to, to. like he was in a mass caster and it's like, bro, one person like they, like they lift, like they lift lower body every other day. And I don't look like, I, 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 I ain't got the knees to do it, bro. I wish I could, but I can't. He look, he, he is, it, it, it. He either needs some smaller pants or he need to get in the gym and, and, and work on something. Because yeah, I'm Hush. like, damn, Tana. Because like everything he does, it looks it looks cricky at points, except for like when he's in like he's in like contact with somebody. Hey, like man. when he has to move or anything, it looks creaky. Tana Hush, and and it's it gets more and more noticeable as the years pass. He need to pull them shits up like Hedgesero or you know he need. <laughs> but Hedges, to, that's the need, thing though. To Hedgesero the trick, yo. Hedgesero got he got the pants. And then he got like the the like almost like the <laughs> what's the joint of suits? Uh, what yes, are they called? I know what you're talking about. The, uh, it's like the third. Uh, I don't. Oh my I God. don't know the name of it. It's different colors. It starts with a B. Bayonet's not the word. It's bayonet's for, with a gun. Uh, whatever. But like he is almost like a, he has like a mini corset type of deal going on, right? And then he has suspenders hanging off of it. It's almost like Shingo when he has a high ass. Joints or whatever else. That's what that's what Hedges Sarah got going. On. Sorry, Cumberbund. Yes, I don't know what I said. Band that for. Yeah, a Cumberbund. That's what that looks like. Hedges Sarah got going on. I, Tana, Tana, he gonna have to either he gonna have to dish the low the low lying uh, waistline pants. He got to move. He got to move up. He got to go holler at Jericho. Yeah, get one of them. Yeah. Uh, he can get a bodysuit. He gets one of them uh, Nakamura 
full on body suits. Oh man, <laughs> oh, it ain't man. That bad. <laughs> like if he, like if he goes on a cut right now, he'll he'll still look good. But like he just you know he in the middle of a bulk right now, and then like you know he got, he bulking, but like he ain't working on his glutes. And it's like bro, you, you like you ain't got no ass, Tony. Right. Tony, you can't move. Like he been, that's where the power come from. He been that's, bulking. That's for- where that's where everything <laughs> come from. The ass, you got you got to work on it, man. You from the atrophy, you ain't gonna be able to move. You you are you. Are, he's aging in the grandfather. When he still might have, you know, he can stave off a little bit more. Tony, he need to you know, yank them bitches just under the nipple. You know, that's what he need to have. All right. That, that, like- nah, that's that that's too much. You got him out here doing the old boxer trick. Yeah, you know, pull it up. Yes, man. He, he you would have had a man out there like uh. <laughs> Tana should be running around like uh, Braun Strowman, man. Even had that man like 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 post peak Greg Valentine. Yes, you know, <laughs> hike them hoes up. Oh man, what what is up to you often to get into that phase? Oh man, you know they, 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 you know I I was looking at uh like seeing like the last time FTR was around, you know uh, Daz Harwood was out here looking like Tomohiro Ishii. With that, with with the pants, like kind of long, long boys. Short. That's true. That's so true. It, it it might be closer than you think. <laughs> yeah, did he have a weight belt on? Yeah, yeah, he did. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, the Abdul the Busher. Yes, exactly. You know. Oh man, hang <laughs> it up. Oh man. Oh man. But yeah, I mean, this was a a fine matchup. I'll see you. You know. Always cool to get Ace and Okada in the ring, like you mentioned, Rich. But it definitely seemed like the crowd wasn't as like I don't know, taken aback, like excited about that. Uh, I guess we've we've seen it a lot in America now, and it's kind of yeah. the, the end of the rivalry, and it's not quite as special seeing those guys mix it up uh, in the states. But I still thought it's always a cool moment to kind of throw back to that rivalry, and also we got this whole like, Young Bucks acclaim storyline going on. The acclaim beat the Bucks in the title eliminator. Was that last week, two weeks ago on Dynamite? Yeah. So that's coming. Blood and Guts is coming. So essentially, they played this, that video too before the match. Oh yeah, that the promo video, that uh, the video package, that, that was hilarious. Um, yeah, the propaganda. Yes, they. So when Okada came out, he had a huge reaction, and then it was like, oh yeah, he's a heel. It's one of those, and then like you know he you know he he gets in, he he attacks Tanahashi on the apron. You know, Tanashi gets in. He he tees like he's gonna wrestle. He gets out. He does all the cl- all the classic stuff, and then like you know, the young bucks are you know they're they're trying to get over with their shtick and their wackiness and their charisma, and it's working to a certain extent. But like they're not they're not working their ass off. Like this isn't like them in two thousand twenty at the end of two thousand twenty one where like they're heels, but they're also being fucking awesome. It was very much like we're just leaning all the way into like. You know, we're covering up our bodies. We're not doing too much. And then the crowd started doing the CM Punk, fuck CM Punk chance. And I was like, oh, now it's a track. Now, like, so much stuff is happening that is, like, not killer that is now, you had the crowd detracting from the match. And, like, you know, honestly, I felt like the in and outs and the personalities and stuff and everything and the, the matchups, like, it was very, it felt like a very road to style match to build towards getting Tanahashi and Okada in the ring. Uh, but ultimately, like the match only really sung like crazy when, or not like crazy, but like really sung when like Bones was in. Yeah, I uh, had a question here from Bruce. Uh, it says, is "Anyone having more fun than Okada right now? Where do you see him fitting in at Wembley?" Uh, I think he'll have a huge singles match, hopefully against K Omega. I mean, that's what we all want. Yeah, that would be that's incredible. Um, I know a lot of people are down on Okada um, and with the his new catchphrase and people are thinking he's kind of like Ron Simmons and there's a lot of people who, you know, the, the pure elitists are not uh, fans of the whole what Okada's doing right now, but I, I think he's it's been very entertaining. It's been hilarious and this is a guy that people thought couldn't, you know, hack it on US TV every week and he's developed the character. He fits in well with the Young Buck and the whole EVP stuff. I, I think he's been hilarious. I I have a you know I I just questioned to figure out what Okada could have done that the Puro elitas would have liked anyway. I mean, there is a it's, it appears to me there be that there's a stark divide between like all right if you watch these people in New Japan Pro Wrestling and, and their native tongue is Japanese and and you see them in Stardom or you watch them in New Japan 
and then you see them try to modulate their game towards American wrestling and what is not their first language. And they're getting over with the live crowds. And it's something you not necessarily are in love with. Then it's a you thing. Like, I've seen people say they absolutely hate Damina Shirakawa, Tony Storm, um, Mariah Maysell. And I'm like, I- I'm sorry. Like, we we all saw the stuff that Mina what has been doing in stardom and also Tokyo Joshi Pro before, right? This ain't this is not this, this is, is not something that she is not signing up for and is not like spearheading. Like it's absolutely was, in her wheelhouse. Like she wasn't doing rings before. Like I don't <laughs> <laughs> right. Like she she would lose and cry and then like you know occasionally like become obsessed with someone like that or spit black goo. Remember she did with Kamatani? Yeah, or the bloody angel thing with Tam. She was crazy, <laughs> right? Right, like it's not you know this isn't like she could be serious and I think she had her best when she is serious, but she loves to do wacky shit. This is her doing what she wants to do. This is across three promotions I've seen her do wacky shit. So, um, what Okada, I you know obviously is a different language, so he can't be as articulate or as he normally is, but like. The rainmaker, him saying bitch, him doing the VP funny stuff. Like, I don't think it's too much different than like these last few years in, in New Japan being a dickhead that doesn't put over people, put over young guys. Like, there's not too much difference except he's funnier. Like, I would like him to have um better defenses or a actual like like opponent that's or a challenger that is somebody he could build a true pro- pro- uh, program with. I almost got my phone off the off my stand, but. Yeah, like outside of that, I'm okay with where they are. I just like them, I, but I do feel the same thing about like that people have with complaints of like it feels like a holding pattern for something. If it's Omega, I'm willing to wait. If it's not, hopefully it's something else great. Yeah, but yeah, an Omega match at Wembley would be awesome. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff they could do, but yeah, I think that. I think people are kind of kind of waiting for what's next, but also you like mentioned James. Yeah. This was definitely a big like road to like almost a road to blood and guts kind of matchup here. But I think everybody did their job well. Fine matchup, like and Rich me mentioning we had a uh, you know Billy Gunn, the, the top star of the promotion, come out run <laughs> run off the elite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no Bill Firearm, don't fuck around. You know, yeah. <laughs> we, we didn't mention uh, Daddy Ace, did we? Oh yeah, so Ace. Scissor me, Scissor me, Daddy Ace. Daddy Ace. Yeah, Bowen <laughs> said that. Yep. Sure oh, is. man. Hilarious. So uh, following that, we had a Owen Hart Foundation men's tournament quarterfinal. We had the American Dragon, Brian Danielson, defeating the Rampage Dragon, Shingo Takagi, in 20 minutes and 19 seconds. This match is great. It built so well. To it felt like you know the kick out of the first uh, bicycle knee. It felt I it honestly thought the match was over, um, but it wasn't, and it kept going. And like I thought that, you know, I, I thought that like Brian's taking control of the match early with te- technical ability, and then Shingo just overwhelms with striking and power. And then it's up to Danielson to fight from underneath with the with the bad with the net nerve damage from the neck and shoulder and all that kind of stuff from the 2014 injury with Orton uh, to to fight back. And then like he he has a match one and like I I just thought it was great. It was great. Um, I thought the Styles match together. I thought the Shingo played great as a heel. I thought it was great. I thought it was great. Uh, I think probably four and a half. Shingo as a heel was like the most interesting part of this uh, thing for me because he was like he's doing the, you know all, all <laughs> yeah. that stuff his and middle fingers like, he's doing I was like, the, well, yes. I was like this, this yes. guy's a fucking genius like I was like this is this is proof that if you, great wrestlers will, will be great anywhere if you let them like right. and um you know are you saying now that you wanted to see Kabashi back in the day actually work heel like you thought he was gonna have to <laughs> 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 you know yeah. but um. You know, I, I did kind of get taken out of the match early. Just it's another like one of Danielson's tropes, I think, at this point to yep. fake injured or whether it's a head injury, a neck injury, yeah. or yeah. Um, one of those, you know, fake seizures. Like he's done yep. that too. I and, thought this was more tasteful than the fake seizures. 
Yeah, like at first I couldn't tell. I was like, is this supposed to be like the seizure? Like I was trying to figure out which one it was. And I was oh. like, oh, and this was like five minutes into the match. And then it was like, he's got to wrestle the rest of the match like this. I, I thought it made for a less interesting match. But it's like, if this was not Brian Danielson. People would be telling this man, this doesn't make sense. Uh, where's the psychology? <laughs> the, like all this stuff like that lesser people I think would get killed for. But. It's Brian Danielson. So, but what what do you mean? Like, if you do something in the beginning, imagine it's like it's supposed to reflect nerve damage, yeah, or it's supposed to reflect um, like a seizure or whatever. Like these yeah. thi- these are things that like I all in head injuries. I know it's like yeah, this is pro wrestling. You're supposed to be like you're supposed to act injured or work the audience or all that. I just think the head injuries and the seizure stuff is like. He keeps doing it over and over again. But so this wasn't like, a seizure. This was nerve damage down his arm, like a stinger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I couldn't tell. I've seen so many of them. It's, oh, it's okay. hard to, it's I mean, hard to look, distinguish well, them. When he does a seizure thing, like we did that, was that Garcia or was that uh, Guevara? I think he did the the seizure against Garcia. Right when he did that, I was I was like, nah, fuck that. I don't want to see you do that. Like, but I. But when he did the arm thing, I was like, "Oh, this reminds this is reminds takes me back to like when they had to, when they, they had to stop that match with Daniels or with with, with Daniel Bryan and Orton in 2014." Yeah, mm-hmm. on, during that summer, and I was like, "It maybe obviously he's you know a long history of watching him, but it's like, oh, is is that and it, and like so it worked for me. Obviously, I knew what it, I knew it was work immediately because but but I will say it was a nasty high angle bump he took on the, on like a t- elevated twist and shout type of thing." And like then he sold it. I was like, oh, he's selling that. And I was like, that works. I was like, I'm glad it's not a seizure. But commentary did mention seizures. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's probably where you thought, like, is this a seizure thing? Well, also, too, yeah. there's the whole uh tiger driver storyline and yep. uh, him coming back from yep. that. He did have, you know, the Kinesio tape all taped up on the neck. And so uh, yep. I, again, I was a little bit I kind of see where you're coming from, Rich, but then also had to remember the whole, you know, the Will Tiger Driver storyline building up to that. And I think the whole story here with uh Danielson is all right he's saying in the media you know I'm not you know healthy enough to be a world champion and he's doing the whole last run thing and I think everybody's kind of clued in now and it's pretty clear that he's kind of on the way to Wembley and so I think every tournament match we see we're going to kind of see this kind of beaten down broken down guy written fighting for what he loves and fighting for this uh one more shot but yeah, I thought he was great here in the match, and like you mentioned, uh, Shingo was also great and kind of uh, learned how to you know flip it on the fly and be work more of a heel, do a little bit more character work than he, he normally does um, in Japan. And so throughout the match, uh, Shingo definitely tar- think, targeting the neck, pumping bomber, uh, main in Japan. Yep, and I think it's also credit to Shingo and his experience doing Dragon Gate USA, and you know stuff with you know Gargano in different times, and like this is a seasoned vet that's been all around the world. And you know, it was like a Hall of, of Famer, people, a lot, yeah. right? And a lot of people have missed the different stages of his career because it's, you know, it's hard enough to get someone that's a wrestling fan from over here to watch Japanese wrestling, let alone not New Japan pro wrestling. So, like, yeah, this this dude has been around and has a lot of tricks and a lot of tools in his bags, and I was glad to see him pull and be able to flex some of those muscles that he may not have been able to use on uh, different points from his experience. I, I think that's really cool. Yeah, I, I think this is uh, this is one step for Danielson on his way to Wembley. Yeah. Same. So then uh, following that match, we had the AEW Women's World title match. Timeless Tony Storm defeats Mina Shirakawa in 11 minutes and 42 seconds. Great match. I think they got the wrong winner, though. And I'll tell you why. Um, so They're this is... this is well, You still it. Yeah, everybody <laughs> did win after the match. But, um, <laughs> like, uh, so this is where I think at Forbidden Door, they can be more creative rather than being so protective over everyone. We know Tony Storm has had this belt for a long time, and I think this is part of the the love affair with long title reigns that has happened in the last, last couple of years to where they lose the ability to throw people off. Um, we saw Mariah May win in the pre-show. We see how that bracket's breaking. We see what it looks like. We can pretty much pencil in Mariah May. So I'm looking at it like, why assure everything before you have to like if mina who was over who who came out had a great match had a crowd you know people would have went for it i i'm pretty sure 
if Mina beats Tony Storm, like it's like that little bit of uncertainty to where it gives Forbidden Door like, oh shit, it gives it a shot in the arm, like, yo, you could actually see something you don't expect. And then, you know, she can win it back a month later. Like they got blood and guts coming. They can do that. And then you could even use it. Like I pitched a storyline to the guys earlier today. I was like, yo, just have like Mina win. Uh, Tony Storm snap again, and then like she like gets a rematch somehow, but she beats like Mina within like an inch of her life, damn near. And it's like a darker, angrier, like vicious Tony Storm. Like, and it's like that shit I was doing before was almost like for play or whatever. But then it's like now Mariah has to avenge uh, Mina and go for the belt or whatever. And then like you've got you bought yourself another month or so before you have to like essentially give it all away away um i i think there's just like another layer they could have tapped into that would have uh enhanced this a little more but enjoyed the match a lot yeah i i haven't actually been able to see this match actually this is the time i actually got in uh so this is like the one match i've missed but i did see the post match because as, as, of course of course as i walk into uh zach's house when I, that's when they're you know doing that but like i'll have to go watch that yeah uh really fun matchup here i thought this was one of the uh really great programs that they built going into this show and the the tv ratings and the quarter hours reflect that and uh mina got over uh really well um and again another one of these uh japanese stars that come over and people are like i don't know who they are i don't get it why are they on tv they can't translate to to us tv and uh, Mina proved very well again look at her quarter hours and and how everything built up and uh, yeah it's a really good feud and a good story they told here uh, in the match and uh, yeah I agree with you Rich I do think that it, it could have been more interesting had you had Mina win get the title back and then also there's enough time you know Wembley's what August 26 or whatever there's, a, there's enough time to flip the belt back get it back on Tony do your big Tony and Mariah uh next act of that story they're telling but i guess that i get from one, uh, the other standpoint of what you want mariah to be the one to get end this long reign of tony storm and that's probably going to have yeah. a whole other progression there they probably i think mariah's probably going to be uh heel there and kind of be more aggressive towards tony so maybe they were they're going to go more baby face with tony versus tony being the heel um and mariah being the face challenger uh, but overall, a uh, really good matchup here. Uh, Tony gets to win, and of course, you know, post match celebration, they all kiss uh, backstage. They were all uh, grabbing cheeks. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, they, got the, they got the good old fashioned triple kiss. You know, made for famous on Jersey Shore, uh, a show that I watched quite extensively uh, in my younger years. Well, no, it, that actually wasn't on Jersey Shore. That was on the MTV True Life version on Jersey Shore that set them up to then go to Jersey Shore. Ah. And then, yeah, yeah, the proto Jersey Shore. You're like, what? what is going on here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so... She takes them both like I mean, Tommy Dreamer. I think... <laughs> so... I'm, I don't necessarily disagree with like if that was the route they were to go. I would have enjoyed that if like Tony had got dark in this match, beat Mina up really badly, and then that has Mariah now on the path to avenge her friend on the way towards winning the winning of uh, the tournament and then going to Wimley. Uh I just because I don't know necessarily what the schedule is for Blood and Gus. When, when is Blood and Gus? It's in July, I think. It's yeah. July. Okay, it's so it's July like, twenty something. Okay. Yeah, because like the Grand Prix because the Grand Prix starts August tenth this year, I think. So I, I didn't know if that was gonna be like a schedule conflict. Obviously, I don't know you were thinking about that or whatever, but I was like, I don't know if that could work that way. But it probably could, uh, given what I think the schedule is. So, I mean, that's that's something on the option. But like, uh, I would have July liked 19th. to see the whole. Th- okay, yeah. So it would have been able to work out. So yeah, um, I think it's successful. I think this is like a thing where like, Hey, there's still time to do that. If you want to, Mina seems like she wants to come back and forth and fly back and forth. So, um, there's still time to do that. She's uh, done a really great job. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah. I, I think it's definitely bring her back. Should be, um, you know, continue a part of the story. Also, they're a part of a faction now, but again, I think the whole story of Mariah winning the belt from Tony, Maybe you have Mina in the middle between Tony and Mariah. <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of ways you can spin this thing. 
Switching it like a Rubik's Cube. You know, <laughs> slightly adjusted. <laughs> um, any other thoughts on this uh, matchup before we move on? Nah. No, I, I thought it was excellent sapphic entertainment. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I, I want I can't wait to hear the Tunnel Talk review of this match. Yeah, that's going to be great. You got the whole you got the holes leaked. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to get her some ice. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> uh, well, uh, the next match we had uh, Zach Saber Jr. defeating Orange Cassidy, Orange Bullocks. In uh, 16 minutes and 22 seconds. I had trouble getting into this one um, at first, but uh, eventually it got me. Um, but yeah, it, it, just, it just took them a minute. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know what was missing from the last match that they had, but it just felt like it just, it took a while for them to get into gear. Um, so, I, but what are your, what are y'all thoughts on it? Hey, Piro Elitas, New Japan guy beats the AEW guy. <laughs> you guys see what happened? Did, did you see this? Is, is, is this okay? Wait, he's not Japanese cool. rich, so they're still going to be Oh, mad. Okay, okay. New Japan guy beats the AEW guy. Uh, Nothing. Nah, um, th- this was cool. Um, you know, I was, you know, Zach Sabre doesn't incite me, you know, to traditionally or anything, but um, Orange Cassidy's great, man. He, he can he can wrestle anyone and this is another example of his value of him being able to go in there and match anybody's style he can lose he'll still be over he's an institution uh at this point and i think as the years have gone on saber is going to find himself in higher positions on these shows and within new japan <laughs> so it's like you have to you kind of have to like show deference to that like i don't I don't see him as the type that is uh, that is kind of on the radar for AEW, but you never know. Um, but you know, it was good. You know, especially the closing sequence. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was a really fun matchup. Uh, yeah, also too. I mean, it's, it did start off slow, and I feel like the pacing of this card was just a little bit weird. And it's funny. I was listening back to our Forbidden Door review of last year uh, before we started recording, and we were also talking about the kind of the the pacing and the whole like buffer match kind of thing of like a hot match and then kind of cool down. And I, I think that sometimes that kind of hurts these cards and kind of the flow of these cards. And I feel like also, I think the people were also kind of a little bit more emotionally invested in the whole, like Mina and Tony Storm match. And there was a lot of kind of fan engagement there. And then now it's like, all right, another reset into like a more serious, like technical wrestling match. And I think that might've probably Made a, a slow start there, uh, but eventually they, they picked it up and it's great stuff. And I think, you know, Zach has been having a, a really great year. You know, he had the Danielson match earlier in the year, Hechicero match, and he's been uh, kind of low key, just kind of killing it in New Japan. And he's probably one of their, you know, top in ring workers right now. And he's a favorite to uh, win G1 this year. And I think this is going to, again, elevate him to be, yeah, one of those top New Japan guys that's going to represent in these kind of cross promotion shows. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I think he's uh, uh, one of the top guys. You got, I think he's definitely going to be one of those um, three spots advancing from the A block into uh, G1. And uh, he's a guy that's just, I think he's really elevated because a long time ago, I was not a, a huge Sabre fan. And, um, you know, I, I've learned his game. He's, you know, he's put on some muscle. He's been doing more striking. And he just, he's just so, so smooth in the ring. He's a great wrestler. Yeah, like he's not he's he'll never be my cup of tea all the time, but like he's had too many great matches and matches that I love to be like, nah, like I you know, and I think I think Rich is in that same boat with me. Like we don't love him, but like the skills is there, the matches ring off when they ring off and hit us at different levels, but people respect it and he he needs a he needs a very he's one of the highest like high floor guys in pro wrestling. Yeah. Like he comes out there and is like if you like, even if you don't like his style, I'm still slapping three and a three and a half on something. Mm-hmm. Like it's very rare you'll be like, "Oh, Zack Saber single smash, three stars." Nah, just too much thought into it. Too much thought. Um, but yeah, uh, as you mentioned, like you know, where he's positioned, where he will position in like these AEW uh, merger shows or cross cross off shows, like 
Tony holds him in high regard. They let him do the uh, the press conference uh, after two. Okay. Yeah, yeah. he did. Like, yeah. it's just obvious he holds him in high regard. He's always he always has. And um, you know, I don't know what his life situation is as far as you know how much he loves living in Japan because he's been there forever. But yeah, I think he's really set on trying to you know win the G1, win the world title. He's been making lots of comments. There's an uh, interview on Sports Illustrated that you know he would see himself kind of a, a failure if he didn't win G1 this year, win the world title. So, again, I think that's going to be one of the story arcs in the A block. And it's got to be. Getting Zach to the Dome. And I, I think now is the time to do it while they're still trying to get, you know, Umino and Suji going. Zach's, what, 36? I, I think this would be a great year to, yeah, give him that G1 win. And uh, his style would probably work good for a, 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 a being down Naito, which we'll talk about <laughs> a little bit later. Oh, but. yes, we will. <laughs> uh, but I, I feel like that that wouldn't be a super hard style match uh, for Naito. And, uh, again, I think Zach, he speaks the language. He's been there for a while. Yeah. Leader of TMDK. Like, there's so much um, upside with him uh, being a champion and getting in a Tokyo Dome main event. Yeah, and also Naito, and also Sabres one of Naito's best opponents in the last few years. So yeah, like it, you know, like every other year when I actually watch G one, one of my one of my favorite pastimes is watching him be in the same block, and then Naito be that man and watch his, and watch Saber lose his shit. It's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, well, they're in the same block again. They're they're both in the A block, so <laughs> <laughs> you know it, it is an even number of years. So this is a time I would watch a G one. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so a good matchup here towards the end. They're uh, trading pin attempts. Uh, Orange Cassidy looking for the the mouse trap, but uh, Saber stops him, hooks the arms, hooks the legs. I don't know what wacky name this submission has. You know the hurrah or this incredible year, Clarky Cat, the Orange whatever. Bollocks. <laughs> put, he put Orange Bollocks in the Orange Bollocks. The Orange Bollocks tie up. <laughs> As was trying not to go crazy at ringside, you know Orange Cassidy. You know, this man wearing white and orange in the ring, like, you know, Taz don't really be going for that shit. <laughs> yeah, like, has, has he, has Taz ever been like, yeah, you know, Kabashi stole my shit? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so good stuff there. Uh, Zach gets the win. And following that, we had another six man tag match. We had the team of Hook, Katsuyori Shibata, and Samoa Joe. Defeating the Learning Tree team of Big Bill and Chris Jericho teaming up with the NJPW World TV champion Jeff Cobb in 14 minutes and two seconds. Hi, guys. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (sighs) When are we going? When are we going to pull the cord? When are we going to cut the shit on Hook? Bro, I'm ready for Hook to go to SGW Uganda. I, no, no, no. I, obviously, me and you, you know, I was, I, look, I was at, like, when he first came out, he was over. I was like, bro, there's nothing, I don't think there's nothing there. I don't think there's nothing there. And then he, I'm like, and then I'm, I got to suffer through it because the crowd's go wild for him because he eats chips and he has crazy hair and he has a hoodie. He don't say shit. I'm like, this is fake mystique. This is <laughs> fake mystique. And uh, Dunstan, uh, yeah, he man, doesn't want the show live. He said you had to be there for the amount of people that got up and left in this match. I, that don't surprise me. Like this whole like we're at a point now because of the shit that happened with the dude that gave Jericho the the stink when there aren't actual accusations or uh, legitimate accusations or uh, accused at, thrown at him just hearsay people have taken to it it's caused confusion in his reactions he's had to adjust and now he's and he's been on a down cycle for like now in year two of a down cycle and now he's at the point where like now he's scraping the plate with Tad or sorry with Hook and like Hook ain't good and like the thing in these matches is when it's when it's hook and it's jericho jericho is carrying hook but the crowd don't want to see jericho jericho they want to see uh jericho lose so jericho putting over somebody the crowd is like they're dead for hook look shibata came out loud or big pop uh and then, like, Hook came out, it was like it was dead. And I was like, Oh, this in is the, home in the, in area. The state area. This is bad. Mm-hmm. This is bad, bro. And like, these, um, I don't know, these alliances with Hook. It's like, why does Hook want to hang out with these old men? <laughs> <laughs> like, what sense does this make? Like, well, I mean, la- I, I will say this, like, 
I, I think that given that they showed a certain videos take backstage, I think Hook found, found some leadership, quality leadership in some more Joe. Is that a meta story? Is that a meta storyline? It's like, hey, t- Hook was out there watching CM Punk fold up his it, the person he's been in. Uh, he just came out with a match at a back with, and then, then sat there and then let the shit happen. And Joe out there in action, you know, trying to save his fucking Wembley match. <laughs> uh. It's, so I, I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I had a, a revelation about Hook last night that I said to Jay. Hook with some young dudes. <laughs> uh, Say again? I, I had a revelation about Hook last night that I said to James when we were watching at Zach's house. I was like, there's a Shane McMahon kind of energy about Hook. Like, he did say that. He did say that. Like, there's a... Like, <laughs> it's, it's like, bro, There, you watch him, aside from when he throws suplex, he looks untrained. Yeah, he used to be like, kind of bumbling around, throwing these, like, wild, like, Shane McMahon clotheslines that Shane would, like, jump up and do, and it's just like... Like, he's throwing his body around, like, uh, who was the wild-ass uh, wrestler out of the Von Erichs? The one with no, the one that wrestled with no barefoot. Uh, Kevin Von Erich, I think. There's some there's some Kevin Von Erich throw his body around with no care type of thing, but I don't mean it in an endearing way. It looks like, bro, you finna hurt yourself. Like, when he threw that double axe handle off the top rope, it's like, <laughs> how do you fall like that? What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. I like I don't know, man. He's like He looks uncoordinated. Yeah, yeah. He looks uncoordinated. And like you mentioned we were talking about last night, James. It's like they're trying to push him as this like super killer tough guy, but he's because he's Taz's son, right? But he's, and then he's, he's in the small... room with Jeff Cobb, Chris Jericho, and Big Bill, who all make him look like a fucking like junior, like make him like a middleweight. Right, it's like in the ring with heavyweights. You want to be, us to believe he's this badass, like suplex throwing guy. It's like he's the smallest guy in the ring. Like, like the explosion is not there either. Right, and it's like it, it would be one thing if you're like Darby Allen and you are using your quicks to your advantage. No, he's not doing it that way. He doesn't look. He doesn't look like he has incredible footwork and he can move on a dime. He's agile and all that kind of stuff. And he has all this incredible body control. He's not AJ Styles, right? And I'm not saying he has to be AJ Styles, but he also has to not look like some. He don't. He also has to look like more than just like a a back like a a person that like did amateur wrestling that just is coming out here. It don't need. Well, it don't. <laughs> he it needs to look. John Juris is a better pro wrestler than Hook. <laughs> yes. John Juris flat out, straight up. <laughs> I've seen John Juris wrestle. I agree. Yeah, I'm rich. Uh, I agree. Jeremy, when you watch John Juris wrestle, yes, John Juris was the man. <laughs> y'all, y'all go over okay. to the uh, the GUW YouTube channel. It's still up. You can watch some some classic John Juris action there. But yeah, yeah. it's just it, it's <laughs> got to look. It, it needs to look more polished than that. Like this is a person that would be stuck. In in one of them seven rings in hell, if he was uh in WWE in the, in the performance center, he would never get to the next. He would never move on to the next ring. Damn. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to see Joe and uh, Jeff Cobb. Yep. It sounded like. Yeah, um, I wanted to see if you can give him a tour of the islands. Sh- shout out to the big niggas. You know that's. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And that's another thing, like going back to that match they had between Jericho and Hook that didn't work out the last pay per view or two pay per views ago, Cameron's one, he's all running together on me. Like when Hook is throwing those suplexes on Jericho, it's like, bro, it, it, it looks like it looks like you it, can't lift him, right? It looks like I, I'm be, forget it, we all know it's cooperation, but it looks like it, it doesn't look like fluid hips popping. It looks like uh, got him over, uh, got him over. And luckily, he didn't look like that this time, but it's like, it reminds me of that when he's in the ring and he's in there with Cobb, who's bigger than Jericho, and the build is bigger than Jericho. It's like, I don't I don't know what we're really doing here. He needs, he's, he needs to be, he needs to find a tag team partner. Like, one of the worst things of the whole CM Punk, Wimley thing, or whatever else, was like, he had found a person in Jack Perry to carry him and hide some of those, some of these limitations. And then he had to go off TV and he was stuck on his own. And they should have kept Jungle Hook going longer than they did, but you know, if they felt like they owe Jack because Jack is great mm-hmm. in the ring. Yeah. 
So yeah, so uh, the the Samoa Joe team here gets the win. Hook uh, ends up hitting the juice effect on Chris Jericho, getting the win for the team. So clearly, we're gonna get another uh, FTW title match with Hook and Chris Jericho, maybe at the Blood and Guts Dynamite. I, I or I hope they don't drag this thing out to Wembley. <laughs> oh man! I, I, look, if you're Chris Jericho, I think. <laughs> If you go to Wembley, don't you assume they're just going to take care of Jericho like at a higher level than that? I do. I, I'm still trying to figure out what the situation is with Minoru Suzuki and that whole tease from last Wednesday. Yeah, that's still out there. Like, yeah. I don't. Was that a setup for a match in the future? Who knows? Because the, the video he said, "How about you face me at Forbidden Door for the FTW title?" Right, and so that's why everybody's like, "Oh, we're getting." Jericho Singles. and Suzuki. And we all would have rather seen that match. Yeah, they would have had a way better match. Of course. They would have had a fucking brawl and they chopped shit at each other. Yeah. And then the whole, yeah, Jeff Cobb thing happened on Collision on Saturday. So I don't know what's going on. I mean, I guess Suzuki's not really a New Japan guy. He only worked, worked like one New Japan show and it was Winnie City Riot this year. Um, so I don't know what's going on with that man. <laughs> right, right. Do look, what if, if my choice is a Minoru Suzuki or evil, give me Minoru Suzuki. Give me Minoru Suzuki in 10 years. I, I agree. <laughs> uh, so uh, next match up here, we had some more RLPW. We had the AEW TNT ladder match for the vacant championship and the scapegoat Jack Perry. He defeats Dante Martin, El Fantasmo, Kanosuke Takeshita, Leo Rush, and Mark Briscoe in 16 minutes and 56 seconds. Big Jack, baby. Um, This match was flat out insane. Yep. Uh, this was like, I know we've all watched. Um, <laughs> this we are? <laughs> Jacking yes. it. Jacking it, yes. <laughs> um, Jeremy, I told you. What did I tell you last night? You got you gonna have sickos like when they, when they threw the Kesha off because they're like, like oh they finna because the crowd's ready for the to win and they get and he gets thrown off I was like oh they finna have Jack throw him off I'm finna hate this because they finna have even a whole bunch of motherfuckers on the line talking about you jacking off I'm like <laughs> fuck out of here <laughs> <sighs> bro the crowd wanted to catch the win so bad and yeah, I did, they did. Too. um. Missed just like a, just a lot of crazy bumps through these ladders. Um, th- maybe one of the single best table breaks I've ever seen with the Kesha and ELP. Um, oh my gosh, that blue thunder was absolutely nuts. That was crazy. I called it before it happened, and then it happened. I lost it. Yeah, I was so happy. I was delighted. <laughs> yeah, I think that, same, same Rambones. You know, I've been I've been down with Jack Perry from day one. So, um, uh, you know, Jack ends up getting a win. Uh, good for him. You know, Takeshi's going to G1. I think people forgot that or didn't know. Um, And I think in order to, like, I, I think Jack has the juice, like, for, for the Elite Act. Like, the Young Bucks are kind of somewhere else right now. Um, uh, Okada is, like, I don't know. Like, he's he's still, like, I don't think he's sunk his, his, his teeth into anything yet just because he has a belt, but he has no real, like, like his nemesis is, you know, in a hospital bed somewhere. So he's going to struggle in the meantime. But Jack Perry is the guy. Like, and I think just like the time in Japan helped him, time away helped him. And like this man took an L ever in life. Like, <laughs> he just always comes back. Like, you know, no winning. Like, you, you play the CM Punk stuff, he's a bigger star after. Um, you know, he's riding around, you know, in the bus with Anna Jay, you know, who's going viral, you know, on World Star and shit like this. This man's getting his belt now. Like, this guy is like really like like it's hard to like project like exactly where he's going to go. But I can tell I, you where he's not going. As high as Darby, he's not going as high as Darby Allen whenever he comes back. Man, they're gonna have they're probably gonna have a great feud. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that, I mean, I don't, that seems really like they have a few given what they did at uh at the, at the pay per view with that crazy all the Dude, stuff they did to each other. Really, so. I would love that for if that was a Wembley match or something, or you know, uh, all out or whatever. Whenever J- Jack Perry has to walk into all out with the championship in, oh, in Chicago. Chicago, absolutely, Makes sense. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, yeah. they're in Chicago this week. 
I would even keep him off the show this week. I wouldn't. I'd, I'd build that shit up. Like Jack Perry returns home, you know, like <laughs> just Chicago. Don't know, like. That's weird. Uh, oh my gosh! Yeah, I just um, I, he's deserving of the spot. He could be a great heel that faces guys and could be a uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, he could be like the uh, oh my god, he could be a gatekeeper for that title. Like he sets up the next set of, of guys that are going to chase after the TNT title and set a standard for people to get it to like. Dan Garcia was chasing after that belt. We thought it was going to be him and Cope. It didn't work. It could be Cope in, in – I'm sorry, it could be uh, Garcia in uh, Perry. It could be him beating Darby uh, – getting Darby to be like, I got something over him because and we can go, you know, two years down the line and we face each other again and, we you know, we're going to be interlinked because of the pillar stuff. Like, there's plenty of people for him to face uh, that, that could get – he could have great matches with and fuse with. MJF. And I think, like – Sorry, MJF with the roles reversed. I don't. I mean, sure, but I don't think right now. Maybe, in, maybe you think you think. I don't think. I don't think MJF will want to have that feud with him right now. Probably maybe not. in a year. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you you know he's he's calculating that way. He'd be like, no, nah, I don't want to. Like, I it looks like I'm going towards Osprey. Why would I go back? Yeah, yeah. it doesn't help me. You know, you know, even though I say I do things to help myself, even though I end up feuding with anyway. Uh so yeah, like I think down the line that's something they can get back to, right? Like whenever Guevara comes off suspension, you got that there too. Like, but it I think that he's at a level that um certain people love him. Dante Martin, another example. Like there are plenty of guys for him to face in the baby face thing that he can bring interest to, and then like you can have the elite and Okada like fuck with him with the EVP status stuff, right? Like there's plenty of stuff. They can always like do the the one night only or short term like link back up with Christian and the patriarchy. They can always do that. <laughs> just to, just for the nastiness of like, you know what? You were always right, Christian. Yeah, I'm supposed to look out for myself. You were right. <laughs> you know, you could you could you could have them, you know, if the elite break up or whatever else, you get have them be back together and then you can have like Nick Wayne like be be the one left out and he has to chase after you know he's been you know pick pushed aside for the original son you know he could do all of that stuff There's plenty of things to do with jack perry yeah like yeah. I, I i think some of the hate this guy gets is like obviously it comes from you know deranged places and stuff like that but like if you remove all that i feel like it's really easy to project this guy right and also there's another thing was like the thing with him is like once the matches start like that the matches are too strong to deny like the character the promo the charisma level or whatever else that's all debatable that dude is a big match performer and has been proven now over a span of since 2019 like say what you want the dude gets the dude's results are are pretty consistent yeah uh jack perry's a man um this whole scapegoat run has been really good for him Getting linked up with the elite's been good for him. And yeah, I think also this was the right call here to also continue the whole power struggle. The elite, they're collecting all the gold. Um, so also that's going to play into Blood and Guts, play over this whole authority storyline. And I just want to touch on uh, Konosuke real quick. I, yeah, I, yeah man, go ahead. He, he <laughs> was great in this match. He got some great reactions. And I, yep. I, I feel like his reactions are a sign that he has been miscast this whole time. Yep. Like I. Or- or is it that is working well exactly how it's intended to to, to be to where we want him even more? Maybe, uh, maybe, but it's like they're not going to break up the Callus thing and not have Callus and not have him be with Callus for now. Maybe that's down the line, but like, how much longer are we going to go down the line? Because like this dude, like he's obviously one of the elite wrestlers in the world. He's proven that for for years now at this point but like he's on tv and like he gets over in every fucking match he's ever in and it's like they push you know the button. exactly you can push the button whenever because he's automatic but it's also like you know I, they gotta find the right thing like similar to what we were talking about with with phoenix and penta earlier i was saying like they gotta find something for the crowd to rally behind besides just more than the bell rings and you know it's gonna be fuego Right, like, yeah, but I mean, obviously, I, I, that's enough. For, that's enough for people like us. But like, you can build a groundswell of support around these dudes, given the level of talent and charisma they have in the ring. 
Um, so you know, like we'll see whatever happens. Like he's gonna, if he's gonna be the opposite of whatever happens with the Callis family breakup thing, sure. If you want to throw him in there to go opposite of Okada eventually, ding ding ding. Thank ding, you. Ding, I love yeah. That. Yeah, like the first time I ever saw the catch, my first thoughts was this is a, this is a, a a slightly shorter version of Okada that does more power stuff. So yeah, um, I'm with it. Yeah, I feel like the the, the Bay face run that he was on of like having the great matches and then losing, and then you want to finally see him like win a big one. Like I felt like there's all mm-hmm. there was something there, and I don't know. I just feel like the crowd. He's really he always gravitates to the crowd, and there's I think there's a big yeah. play there of him as a Bay face and. I just hate that, you know, the fact that he's, you know, being 20, uh, being Kenny Omega twice and there's been no real follow up from that. Like, why didn't he get a world title shot after that? Why hasn't he been a champion after that? It just kind of feels like he's just been kind of treading water, a part of the whole Don Cows family. And then they brought Will in, so that kind of knocks him off of being yep. the, the ace of that group. And so, I don't know. I just, he's super talented. I, I just want to see him in, in bigger positions. I'll see he is going to be in the G1 this summer. Uh, he's in the B block. And, him and Phantasmo in the B block, so kind of setting himself up here in the ladder match, and also ELP will probably want some revenge after that Blue Thunder bomb <laughs> through that table. Uh, but yeah, Kanosuke was uh, great here, and uh, yeah, I'll see Jack Perry cut him off, gets the grab the belt, gets the win here, and so yeah, Jack maybe, Perry. Maybe Takeshi can help save New Japan by winning the G One and, and headline the Dome. Uh, I mean, I, would I wouldn't mind Takeshi versus Naito. If, I mean, you know, like. When we first got that uh, a couple years ago. We got that Naito in Osprey semifinal. Like it was like I ain't seen Naito try this hard in years. Like you give you give Naito some new blood, he'll try. Maybe, you know. Well, you give you give Shota Umino <laughs> main event caliber new blood. People that are already like you know is automatic. I guess that's a better way to say it. Like you know. Yeah, look a DD like a DDT man uh, coming for the dome. I'm like, all right, <laughs> like, walking the shoes of Kota Ibushi and Kenny Omega. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we see DDT producing the real. You know. <laughs> Brace yourself for something fuel nominal. Unleaded eighty eight is the clear fuel choice. It's cheaper, cleaner, and greener, and it's grown by Iowa corn farmers. Now that's totally worth the hype. So pump it up with Unleaded eighty eight. All right, uh, next matchup, we had the double title match for the AEW TBS title and the NJPW Strong Women's title. Mercedes Monet defeats Stephanie Recur in 16 minutes and 51 seconds. Man, um, I think we have to, you know, tell the truth about, is about it, this match. Is it time to start a dialogue? I think it's time to start a dialogue. And not a bad one, but I think it's just something that we can put on the table and see what the people are, think. Are, can can you give the disclaimer? The, the 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 disclaimer so that you say it so they can so they'll they'll calm down and then like they'll they'll feel soothed and then when you say it, then they'll get upset, but then they'll forget that you said the soothing thing at first. <laughs> Mercedes Monet is the greatest women's wrestler that this country has ever produced. I have been a fan of hers for ten years now. Mm-hmm. Um we all have. And she's awesome. We all agree with that same statement. Okay, yeah. so now that that's out the way, Stephanie Vicker completely outperformed her in this match and, like, was just flat out the better performer, Was got herself over. Uh, I know people are wanting to blame the, the Boston, New York thing. That's secondary, I think. That, that had nothing to do with the whole stuff that was going on before that. Like, Stephanie just completely walked in there and was like, yo, I know you're Mercedes Monet. I know you're an international star or whatever, but I'm fucking great. Like too. And y'all gonna y'all gonna recognize like exactly who I am. I'm and I think the crowd would have accepted and really been in favor of of Stephanie actually winning. Probably. But, you know, you know, the plans were already made. We already saw kind of where that's headed, right? So that wasn't gonna happen. Or whatever, but just looking at how that match played out, the people were living and dying with Stephanie Recur. Yeah, Stephanie absolutely killed it in this match. I mean, this goes back to the first uh, New Japan Strong Wins match they had during the tournament uh, for the title uh, back at Resurgence last year, and that was the first time a lot of people 
uh, saw Stephanie Baker because um, obviously you know CMLL people uh, don't really tune into CMLL like that. It's a little bit harder to watch, and so that was the first time a Western audience got a lot of uh, eyes on Stephanie Baker and thought she was really good in that match. She did a great on, on that that New Japan uh, show there, and yeah, this night she came out and yeah, she just was the the better worker, uh, and she just yeah she just outworked outshined Mercedes here, and it, she flipped the crowd because. Yeah. When Mercedes came out, obviously there was the big CEO chance, people in the crowd, you know, doing the doing the you know the, the money dance. But uh, <laughs> uh, they, they were behind Mercedes at the beginning, but then you saw the way Stephanie hit the ropes, how she was hitting, how she was transitioning into holes and moves, and it's just like, oh, like there's a whole another level to this thing that she's doing right now, and flip the crowd and. Yeah, you want to throw in the whole yeah Boston New York thing, but no, I think it was the performance of Stephanie, how she was working in that ring that got the crowd to flip and was behind her the rest of the match. What are you thinking, James? Stephanie McCurr is a better worker than Sasha Banks. I've watched Stephanie McCurr wrestle less than a handful of times. And I knew that. Um, there is a gigantic misunderstanding in like the level of depth of women's talent around the world. I got into watching stardom because I watched NXT because I watched the Horsewoman. Then I in NXT, and then I saw Asuka, and I loved Asuka, and then I saw Kyrie, and then I loved Kyrie, and then I heard there were two other two others as good as her or better in stardom. Saw EO coming over, and I was like, I'm definitely gonna watch to see who the third one is. My favorite wrestler is now is Mai Iwatani. And then I saw the rest of the stardom crew. Then I saw the a lot of the other uh top wrestlers in Japan. And then along the way, I've also seen wrestlers in CMLO and you know uh La Haritika, Vakur, they can wrestle their asses off. They're really fucking good. And they just move and and can get in and out of stuff and have a smoothness that even the best American woman this country has ever produced in as a worker in the ring does not match. It's fine. I'm not saying she's not great. She is great. She's a legend. But there's just a different level of depth and quality and training over in different places that produce better wrestlers. And like Vakur is one of them. And like, I saw the match that she had, uh, the match she had with a zoomie that went like eight minutes or whatever else at, uh, the Chicago show. And I was like, Oh yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I can't, you know, when she came out, for the for the double title match, I was like, "Oh, this is gonna be really fun! I can't wait to see this match because I know how good I have an idea of how good she is, um, and I think we haven't seen how good she is. Like, I would love to see her versus Mayu. I think it would blow the roof off. Um, but it, you know, Sasha won. Sasha's going to do the double dip thing like she was pretty much th- we thought she was going to do before she ended up getting injured. She'll have a great you know year. She's going to have a great title range. She's going to have great programs. Well." Once she's done with this one thing, but uh, yeah, like this was a really this match had a great closing stretch. It started a little slow. The crowd, you know, um, the crowd. I think Stephanie whooped her ass so much the crowd was kind of like waiting, kind of like waiting, hold hands on feet, and then all of this she's like, "Well, nah, man, she's kicking her ass. She's awesome." And then it started, you know, it's it's this tri-state area, and it's like, oh, she was out here selling out at the at the Boston Celtics games, whatever else. Fuck Boston Celtics in turn. Oh yeah, she's also a Red Sox fan. Fuck, fuck Red Sox. And then like it kept adding on, but like they got they got the crowd uh, in the last in the closing stretch. And like yeah, I thought it was a very good match, very very good match. So yeah, like I, I think it was a success, and I can't wait to see what uh, Mercedes does going you know stateside with New Japan strong and you know or New Japan of America and maybe come back to start them. Yeah, yeah. I'm really interested to see where, what's next with the whole NJP to be strong women's title kind of thing. Because also, you know, this was created for Mercedes before she was in AEW and she was doing New Japan stardom. But you know, now she's both, in both, a, both, yeah. both IJBGP belts or New Japan women's belts were created for her. Right. Both. Yeah. Hey, 
you know, Mayu Iwatani could just drop that shit to uh, <laughs> uh, Mercedes before she goes to Marigold. <laughs> <laughs> That's nasty. Did you see that picture of her and Rossi today? I did, and it's disgusting. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I'm wondering. Yeah, it's, I'm guessing. You know, New Japan they fired for tampering, and then what's he do? The big, the, the company, the the company that they that they that made a a biopic for her. She, yeah, I'm gonna take picture with boy. They finna <laughs> cease and desist your ass to death. <laughs> you ain't learn. You ain't learn. Uh, but yeah, New Japan they they've lost. Uh, you know, John Moxley now as a, a draw for the U.S. show. So maybe this uh Mercedes win's gonna be. Maybe kind of a flop there. You're going to get Mercedes on some of these big uh, New Japan strong shows. And the next one, I think, is August 29th or 30th in uh, Washington, D.C. for Capital Collision. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see kind of where Mercedes goes with that as well as being the, the TBS champion. That's a good point. Yeah. I, didn't, I, didn't think, I didn't think of that at all, but yeah. Uh, so uh, Mercedes, she got the win here. She uh, did the brought back the uh, the bank statement at points of this match. Hits the the money maker, so gets the win. And then we get the the post match. She's celebrating and D M D. The doctor will see you now. Britt Baker makes her return. Uh, you know Tony or Tony Khan mentioned on Observer Radio kind of slightly that you know oh yeah Britt's uh, she's cleared. She's good to go. Yeah. So. <laughs> Britt shows up, and so yeah, we're it seems like we're all, we're on track for uh, Britt Baker versus uh, Mercedes Monet Wembley Stadium TBS Championship. James Straight G- to the nastiness. <laughs> Straight to the nastiness off the rip. Like I, bro, I saw I saw uh, Britt come out and I saw the the dynamic, the camera switch between. I was like, oh yes, this is what we need. This is what we need. We need a big star back to to be to put opposite Mercedes. Like, let's go. Sign me up. Is this match gonna be any good? It can be if they plan it out right. <laughs> they practice. You know, I, I, I'm sure um, Britt can can Mercedes can put the uh, the NEC takeover training wheels on on Britt to uh, get her where she needs to be. But uh, you know, Britt's coming back. I imagine these promos are going to be yeah. furious. Look, man, I I'm already exhausted from seeing like the the fandoms of both the standoms, if you will, of both going back and forth, and it just makes me think of like, oh, this this could possibly be like Sasha in Alexa Bliss level nonsense on my timeline. This could be like Caitlin Clark fans versus W fans on my, nonsense on my timeline. We're not even arguing about each other or arguing actually about like what's happening on screen. They're arguing about my fave, my fave. I don't care. They're gonna have a match. She just came back. She interrupted the champion. She's apparently in the next uh month gonna, you know, be ready to or two months, roughly two months, like get pushed to the point, get enough wins to get to that. You know, I guess nobody else is in the in, you know. Thank God the rankings on this so we can see how she how they how they show their work on that one, but yeah, whatever. Yay. It, it'll be two stars going at it. Will the match be any good? Who knows? But we know there'll be two stars. Like, can two, we have Athena face her, please? Can two stars getting two stars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Athena's injured. I don't know if you know, knew that. Oh, uh, my bad. My bad. She's out for a while. I mean, that. while that is true, there are multiple women on their roster that are better workers than Britt Baker. Like but Jamie Hader. Jamie that, Hader's been out look, longer. Jamie Hader's been out like a year longer than Adam Cole. God damn. <laughs> but you cannot deny that reaction uh that she came back to. That was one of the biggest uh, I'm not denying that the reaction. I'm denying I'm denying what happens once once that bell rings. Cause it's gonna have to ring. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I mean, if 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 you don't want the ring, take it take it over to the E. Hey, they they could do a death match. They could I mean, they could start they could start they murdering could. each other. You know why six it? Hey, it's time. It's time to. It's time to. You know. You know. <laughs> run the razor, Mercedes. You know, <laughs> right across the right across the forehead, dude. You know how shocked I'd be if the, it, look. Obviously, obviously, like Mayu dotted that forehead right last year, but I couldn't imagine her running. Uh, no, that's right. I couldn't Lights imagine. Lights out, man. You know the hardcore queen 
Britt yeah. Baker. Let's go. Brett show the real. <laughs> now, I understand you saying like give her a no rules Thanks. match, but like that th- that Thunder Rosa uh, cage match was also a no rules match. That's true. Yeah, run the razor. <laughs> Bleed for this business. <laughs> yeah, Queen yeah. Amanada is another one that's better than Britt. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> MJ said bunkhouse Brit. <laughs> <laughs> oh That's my funny. gosh. So yeah, so uh, clearly we're uh we're uh, down the road for uh Brit and Mercedes Monet. Uh I I I just please surprise me. Please 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 surprise me. Just be like, you know what? We we did the uh, Forbidden Door review, and James just already said he was awesome about it. But like, nah, they came up with something. And you know what? I gotta say, I was wrong. Please don't don't do not prove me right. <laughs> don't prove me right. We got a uh, Bruiser Brit, <laughs> Cactus Brit, <Britt. laughs> Cactus Brit. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Brit the, Brit the Butcher. <laughs> oh man. Oh my gosh. No, I think Brittany the Butcher has a better ring to it. Yeah, 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 that's, that's, yeah. that's a good one. Uh, so uh, after this match, we had the video announcement of Wrestle Dynasty, which will be happening January fifth, the following day of Wrestle Kingdom, January fourth, in the Tokyo Dome. It's going to be with AEW, New Japan, Stardom, CMLL, and Ring of Honor. Uh, we had a bunch of questions here. I think that can kind of guide our discussion on this, and we kind of talked about it a little bit on kind of the pre-recording uh, of the show. Uh, first, from Rambo, he says, "Is Wrestle Dynasty likely to replace the NJPW Noah show we usually get in January, or be in addition to that?" Look, with WWE waiting around <sighs> with uh, Cyber Asian and shit, it seems convenient. If you were going to replace it, this would be how you would do it. Uh, I would say this seems like they're replacing the normal what they had moved to the night two situation. Yeah, double double gold. And, dash. If, and then if they want to do the because you know it's it's actually Wrestle Kingdom at Tokyo Dome on four and five. Now that don't mean they can't do you know Tokyo Dome. At Yokohama Arena, and then like it's still Noah, or they move on to All Japan. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. Um, but my real question is, how did they let Tony Khan get Ring Honor on there? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> like, you gonna put Converse on that shit? You know what? You know what it probably is? is because ROH has uh, had an extensive history with New Japan. That's true. Yeah. So, yeah but what kind of history, though? Oh, a one sided one. Right. So not in favor you, of New look, Japan for wrestling. Like, they, look, if you had told me. No, six not in favor of ROH. No, all right. Yeah, that's, I've said it wrong. Right. But I'm saying, like, if you had said uh, six years ago, seven years ago, they're doing a Tokyo Dome show and, and Ring of Honor is on there. Like, to the Japanese audience or people traveling, people be like, so? <laughs> like, but I just assume like they're going to have, t- you know, they're going to have certain titles on there, whatever else, held by certain wrestlers. So that, it's fine. Whatever. Um, who is Ring of Honor heavyweight champion right now? Mark Briscoe. Mark Briscoe. I've forgotten that already. He's on TV every goddamn week. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, world champion in a ladder match for the, what, third singles men title? <laughs> Look, yeah. I just want to know, is there going to be an AEW Dynamite from Cork and Hall that following week? You know, can we get Matt Caster rapping to the ring where no one understands him? <laughs> <laughs> why is Matt Cat? Why is Matt Caster making the trip? That's why is he getting? Why, why would he be getting booked? Hey, do you this? think there's like an unofficial AEW ban list from like the New Japan side that like uh, similar to like Tony like, Khan saying we're never putting like House of Torture or the Tongans or, or, or sorry the, the Pacific Islanders on on uh, David on these Finley, all that shit yeah yeah like, is, is there I, an unofficial ban list like I I want to know who's on no it. House of Torture uh, yeah. I mean I maybe maybe. I would love to know. <laughs> I, I would too. <laughs> yeah, but um, 
maybe maybe some maybe some one of us maybe one of us three uh, uh, people in here can ask around. <laughs> you know, maybe I'll have to uh, hit up our, our our good friend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we won't we won't we won't reveal these things. We I, I, I just I would just like to know. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, the idea of the show is is really cool though. There's always been people wanting AEW to go to Japan. Um, and I imagine there are some people not happy with this, but this is kind of where this is headed. They built up Forbidden Door for three years for it to eventually be valuable enough, I think, to put over there. Who whoever could you mean uh would not be uh happy that they're doing this? I mean <sighs> You know, I I, I don't want to get into names, name dropping or anything, <laughs> but you know, they're you getting into certain like uh like demographics. Sure, I, I mean, you know, pro wrestling fandom. Yeah, you know, you know, if you if you're if you have hated every second of of the collaboration between AEW and New Japan, and you just constantly just or looking for ways to be victimized by it and everything like that. Because I look at this show, right? We're, we're kind of talking about it, right? There's really three matches to look at during this show, right? So where there was, uh, you know, interpromotional competition, I would say. Uh-huh. You got Danielson and Shingo, mm-hmm. Zach and Orange, yep. and Naito and Moxley. Yep. And then on top of this, the world title match, you don't even have to send one of your guys the job to swerve. Naito defeats John Moxley. Mm-hmm. Zach defeats Orange Cassidy. Yep. That's I, I don't know what the like it I don't know what the complaints about this show would be. I don't know. Also, House of Torture member, the only one with any representation for House of Torture wins the ti- wins the TNT title in the ladder match. Stupid. What what <laughs> what I want to know is are there gonna be people complaining that there's no video packages for all these AEW stars coming to New Japan? Like, no, there won't be. <laughs> they'll they'll show like a 15 second VTR of these people and then they'll come out and then they'll get over because they're qualified in charisma or like in ring performance, and the crowd will then cheer for them. Because Japanese audiences are assholes. <laughs> they actually enjoy pro wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's going to be, I think the guys are going to go over there and the girls, they make the trip too and find that the roots of these companies tie together. And then you add in CMLO, who goes over all the time for Fantastic yep. Mania. It's like, yep. I don't know the downside to this. Um, I don't know if it's going to be a regular pay-per-view, how they sell it, or if it's just like, you know, through New Japan World or however they're going to work that out. That's, that'll be interesting to yeah. figure out. Yeah. But, I mean, I could easily see that being on the world for 50 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I think this is like one of the major steps to like expanding Forbidden Door. Because you look at Forbidden Door now, right, and what it was three years ago. I think there's an argument to be made that it is not at the level that it was because quite frankly, a lot of the guys from new Japan aren't is over. And then there's been jumps obviously to AEW from the new Japan side. So it's like, I think in order to swing that dynamic to change it a little bit, you do it in Japan. And I think a lot of fans want to watch that. Yeah. And it's easier to draw over there. And it's like, Hey, you can put, you can put Suji Umino, you know, Hiromu, Hiromu, like you can put them in, you know, high spots. Desperado, you can put them in these certain spots that necessarily wouldn't make as much sense to draw in America. Um, like, and it's a lot easier. And also, like, you have people that are, you know, you have you have Kenny Omega, you have Will Osprey, you have Daniel Saint. You're supposed to, you have Okada if politically that's okay to spread around with that. And then you have people that have been around because you know, like you mentioned. Like the Lij thing, like Teton, you could you could do a Teton versus Desperado match if you wanted to, if you want to give Hiromu the night off, right? Uh, or not night off, but like give him something else to do. Like there's plenty of things to do. Yeah. And then like you know the people that haven't been to Japan, like Swerve or like MJF, uh, people who haven't been around in a while, like Hangman, like he was like a completely different wrestler. Um, yeah. Swerve, Hangman, yeah. 
Yeah, then I'll see you if you have people you, like you, you, you. Yeah, come come through. MJF, yeah. I don't, they kinda, <laughs> if you can get a, you, you know, might, you might. <laughs> My, if you want to stay, if you want to stay in Long, Long Island, I will not be upset with you for this one. You want you know if Kenny Omega is healed up, you know how big that would be uh, to get him in there as well. Also getting Okada back. Uh, there's so much you know, stuff that you can do there uh, with this Wrestle Dynasty show. Uh, we had a question from Stale Burger Bun. He says, "How many crossover shows is too many crossover shows?" Um, and I think probably because we've seen an oversaturation of, of these in Japan with United Japan. Pro wrestling, where we're seeing a lot of New Japan, Noah uh, crossover shows mm-hmm. throughout the year, and so I think it, it kind of wars it down. It, it makes it less special when you're constantly doing these shows. And also, you know, I think I mentioned it last week. A lot of times when we're getting these crossover shows, we're not always getting the matches we want. We're getting these, you know, random multi man tags. You got to protect people, and people don't want to do jobs and get beaten. So I like the idea of making it special. You do Forbidden Door once a year. You do this Wrestle Dynasty show once a year. You keep them far apart, make them feel special. Do some match that have stakes, and I think that's the way to go. Because if you keep doing these crossover shows, then I think they become just another pay-per-view, and then you're also going to be having a lot of politics. You're going to be protecting people, and it's just not going to be as fun as they should be. Then one side like is, is very strong. It's like I think there needs to be more give and take than than there actually is like more unpredictability less mm-hmm. kind of an all-star game feel like i think you can get away with that the first year second year you know it, it's kind of the, the cracks are showing a little bit but by the third year like people aren't just lining up to see the all-star game like that mm. yeah i agree uh, next question here, Les Commission 7252 says, after the announcement of Dynasty and the Forbidden Door event last Sunday, do you think New Japan, AEW, and CMLL should produce more major shows twice a year? I don't think Forbidden Door needs to be the only show of the year to have all these companies come together to produce one spectacular show. Wrestle Dream could be another show just like Forbidden Door. It probably won't happen because it's honoring the legacy of Anoki, but it would still be cool. It, it would be cool if it was like on a three-country rotation. Yeah. 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 Like if they did, if they, you know, if they, you know, follow like the, in a similar way to like the triple mania formula of like, we go Monterey, we go Mexico city, we go Tijuana or whatever else we rotate. Like we do three in a year, like in like, all right, we do one, we do forbidden door in North America. We do, or sorry, Canada or America. We do a, tri- a, a CMLO one in, in Mexico. And then we do, one in Tokyo, I think that will work. I think it will work. It it takes a lot, a lot of uh, like cooperation though. Yeah. Um, and it takes a lot of luck with health, and it takes a lot of just like trust in the partnership. Yeah, partnerships. Yeah, I think with uh, CMLL, we've already kind of seen them uh, branch out the Fantastic Mania brand this year. They did uh, Fantastic Mania in Mexico with New Japan guys coming over to Mexico. They did Fantastic Mania UK in Rev Pro. So CML is kind of established as Fantastic Mania. And obviously, every year in February, it goes to Japan and top luchadors go over to Japan for that tour. And so they're kind of building up that Fantastic Mania brand. So maybe you can do something like that with uh, and also include the AEW guys there in Mexico. I think that would be cool. But yeah, I think there's definitely some fire there to do more stuff for these guys, but I definitely think you need to make the show special, though. They're saying uh, Jericho is already jumping out on Mystico, so that's already something that already has wheels. Was that was that last weekend or, or this weekend? That was Friday night. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Larry, it says, if New Japan going forward with their own major crossover on one five, an indication of an even bigger partnership with outside prom- promotions or is it an act of desperation for something to stick? Little column A, little column B. Yeah, like uh, like if, if they can get some money or some interest, like it's a hell of a lot more interesting than a lot of the stuff that's been happening. Um, and and that's just like from a, from the standpoint of like star creation and um, seeing how some of the people are progressing and declining. Like at the same time, so it's like you add outside stuff to 
refresh like your what what you have while you're building your yeah. your new core essentially yeah like they're building up a new core and they're ha- they have a dearth of top main event level stars right now in the eyes of their domestic fan base so where you get stars from in this partnership it's you know getting a john moxley to come in it's getting you know some bcc people to come in it's getting some people from aw to come in and while they're on a down cycle come in you know i i'd imagine as that being a short-term game plan until they have you know the yoda sujis you know that whole the, the the whole you know musketeer new musketeers to come in and like wrestle those guys who make names for themselves then you know because like Nigel can't wrestle all of them <laughs> you know i hope he doesn't <laughs> he can't he can't have like long lasting fuse with all of them you know because he, he doesn't have that much left in the tank at a top level he may not have anything left in the tank right now and i guess that's how we get to it yeah well what the, i'll say a thing about this i don't, i i don't want to uh, categorize it as desperation i feel like well, maybe it's a little bit but they're trying to recoup uh you know money here and that they they ran double domes what starting what was that the first double dome was what 2019 20, 20. or 2020 20. uh, yeah um so yeah. they did these double domes and it was a big thing and it, it worked out well before did, covid happened did double, domes, did double domes and the world stopped <laughs> yeah they, they, they broke the world and so i think this is a great opportunity to you know get back to doing that and not making it two nights of wrestle kingdom and not overextending uh, programs and having to do split nights for that show. You can still have a killer, you know, Wrestle Kingdom card, and then also uh, you bring in the AEW guys, you bring in the Luchadors, you you add Stardom in the mix. Uh, you know, you bring in the, your your Mark Briscoe, your Ring of Honor guys, and I think you can do a, a great card without having to you know split cards up and making it this kind of two night thing they do sometimes with tours. Um, last question before we talk about actually two more questions before we go to the night to a match. Uh, Doctor Larry also said uh, with Wrestle Dynasty announced for one five. Should the main event be Okada challenging for the IWGP title? Uh, I say no because, in, uh, I mean, it almost if you do it that way, it telegraphs like whoever was a G one is doomed to fail because what's going to do better than Naito Okada? Yeah, yeah, and, and it, I, it's tough booking now. Man. What I would say is if if they do that match, <laughs> what do you think is most likely outcome? I I mean I, I don't know. I I feel like they're not gonna TK is not gonna want Okada to lose. Rainmaker bitch. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> now I you know if if that were to happen. I mean, at, I mean, at least, at least your, your decision not to change the logo, you know, hey, at, at least, at least, you know, you know, it pays off. You yeah. win right, in the right. end, right? right. Long term oh, booking. I mean, <laughs> for Nessa, the year will be will would have been would be one up three hundred and sixty days into the year. <laughs> um, man, uh, and it, it boy, you know, as an Okada fan, mm, I. <laughs> I, I don't. It, it'd be bad for Zach. It'd be bad for Zach. The night, the night tough. It'd be bad. It'd be bad. Like it'd be bad for somebody else. <laughs> it, it'd be bad for a lot of people. I think a lot of night <laughs> fans will want to just stop like online discourse. They they this when they tap out. They're like you know what? I've had enough. I, this is broken me. I'm done. Stay the sports. You know. Yeah. <laughs> this man left the company to make more money and then came back and then won the fucking belt on as a side quest. Oh, they'd be sick. They'd be sickened. <laughs> Uh, Brandon Venn uh, asks, hope also if you guys with the announcement of the WrestleMania see on January 5th, what is one match you guys would book? Mm. I want my Darby Allen Hiromu match. Stole what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 w- I want the two nasty sickos to, to, to have a nasty sicko match. Yeah, that, that's a great one. I want to see Okada and Yo- Yoda Suji. Uh, fuck the politics. Yep. They, te- the politics. they, they tease care. it as he left, too. They definitely tease it as he left. Okada and Yoda, Yoda Suji. Yeah, I think either Okada Suji, Okada uh, Umino would be good as well. Yeah. yeah. 
All right. Well, uh, all this New Japan talk, let's talk about the IWGP World Heavyweight title match. We had Tetsuya Naito defeating John Moxley in 17 minutes and four seconds. Rich got. <laughs> Um. All right. Who wants to be honest? I right, I got it. After this match, I like as Jeremy is like, what has been Naito's best singles match this year? And then we and then you know we, we pull up the cage match and like he pointed to a couple matches here and there, but overall he's had a really down year. And obviously we're before the G one, so obviously you know he's going to have his you know. Three, four matches are going to be great. Kick ass. But um, this might be the year where it's where he's really done. It, it, it might be the year. I, 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 I'll hold, I'm will i willing to hold on to the G1. I'm going to watch G1 this year because it's even year. But, um, yeah, I, I have concerns. Um, I, I've had concerns for years, but now it's, it's it seems more con- – it seems more evidence to, to me. Um I also in you know it could I'm willing to chalk it up to him and Moxie just have bad chemistry, but this didn't work, and um, a lot of stuff has not worked, and some things have been unfortunate with uh with Naito's title matches this year, but this is another one where just one good enough, one good yeah. enough. <clears throat> yeah, man, this was um this was a struggle. I don't think this match was over at all. Um, nope. I I think this was um a colossal kind of disappointment. And um, I think both guys are kind of suffering from the same kind of things because like, I don't want to go. Yeah. I don't want to go a hundred percent on Naito on there because I, I thought Naito looked bad. Don't get, don't get a fucked up. Like I think he, you know, he walked through um, with his reputation and whatever and tried to, you know, coast and a lot of this stuff, like you know, his his offense was reduced to spitting and the short arm elbow thing. Mm-hmm. What else you got? Like, if this is the IWGP champion, right? If you're the man of New Japan Pro Wrestling, like everyone has wanted you to be for years, you just need to do more for this position. I'm sorry. Like, and I, I don't know who um, needs to hear it, but like this. It, this is not engaging to watch as as the top level of uh, of the IWGP Championship. And knowing like how they set this reign up to where he won again at the Dome in a less than stellar match, right? Good match, nothing wrong with it or whatever. But we're talking about the main event of the Tokyo Dome here. Like we, it's classic. It's not all the time match, some four and a quarter type of thing, right? right? It's it's classics only, baby. That's 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 what we should you know be sticking with. But they they give him the the couple month break, you know, off the championship, and it's like this this ace run that everyone you know cried and and, and waited for for years and years. Like, what are the results? This is this is bad. And then John Moxley on, on the other side, this wasn't his first stinker on pay per view this year. Um, yeah, that match with Takesha that was not hitting on nothing. That that was on double right. nothing last month. And um, right. you know, there's a lot of rumors going around about about Mox uh, right now with you know what what he he may you know have. Uh, you know, felt about his title reign, how it's being portrayed in AEW and stuff like that. And I, I really only have one real thought on that, and is welcome to Kenny Omega's world, buddy. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> if you're upset, you know that they didn't, you know, portray you a certain way while doing work on the outside of the company. Hmm. You know, and, and if people, you know, are sympathetic to my, I'm like, whoa. You know, when when Kenny Omega was having a fucking match of the decade, and they can't even mention it the next week on Dynamite. This is kind of how they operate. And is that it, – it's like, is this a something to be mad over? Yes, it is. It is totally legit. This is a, a uh, institutional failure. Like, but this clearly is in the playbook. I think Moxley is also stale, um, very yeah. stale. And, like, I think the group has done them all a disservice in the long run. As I, like, kind of always, like, I never gravitated toward the group. Like, it was just – Well, felt- there was a reason for that. You, you, you don't like Regal. Well, yeah, there's that. There's that. 
And then, like, you just, like, look what they do. Like, they're these tweeners who no one ever really gets up on and nothing happens with their dynamics within the group. Like, if the BCC exploded Wednesday night, this would be the most interesting thing that they've done in ages. Yeah, but also, it kind of seemed like they were planting seeds for that with the Kingston thing with Danielson, and then Kingston got hurt, so he got scrapped. Yeah, with them I, going into uh, Anarchy and Arena t- team together, I've, like I, that got scrapped because he got hurt. He had to be switched. I've seen this guy mostly be un- unmotivated before. Yeah, this mm-hmm. looks familiar. Yeah, and you know, can I blame him? Look, we know this company's changed. We know they have writers now. We know we have that's something that he don't fuck with or whatever. And can I blame him for what he wants to do creatively like that? No, but. It's like either you're going to work within like and try to like play ball a little or you're just going to be announced for random one off single matches. And he's going to wrestle this, you know, he's going to want to do his Brazilian Brazilian jiu jitsu style and stuff like that. It's just like I think he's going to he's going to fall down the car. I think, and I, I think he's going to start. And, and it, honestly, I feel like it's kind of time to move him at least if not down, move him to the side. There's a new generation of guys that have, that have stepped up. Now. Here, here's my question. Does John Moxley work if he's not, if he's not a main, if he's not top of the card, main event, ace level guy? Because he's had to do that. And he was excellent at it. And he was my favorite. At certain points, he's my favorite male wrestler in the world um, doing it. But, like, anytime they find little things for him to do to side, because with, like, him reunited with Kingston or him, you know, kind of, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, You know, them doing that little short team thing didn't happen because they lost that match Revolution, right? Took the pin. Uh, Him having that tag match with Claudio at Revolution this year. And then they never follow up on that as their tag team, even though they beat FTR, right? You know, the CMLL stuff. It's a lot of side quest stuff for a guy that had to carry the company on and off throughout four years, the first four years of the company. He seems like he doesn't know what's next and what to sink his teeth into. And um, that's a problem because, like, he was the best character in pro wrestling, in my opinion. And now... When you don't have motivations, you don't. We don't have clear motivations. You don't have clear desires. Or you don't have a way to express them, or articulate them. It's a problem for him because he was what because that was what made the promos work. That's what made the wrestling work. He's not. He's not Will Ospreay. It's you care about the guy and the things he's doing in the in the in the kind of smoke he has with whoever he has smoke with to make you feel that kind of stuff and like. Him and Naito, and, and, and you know, him and Naito, and a few years earlier, it, it should have worked. It just didn't. Um, but I think it's an issue for both of them right now. Naito and Moxie, it's like they're different issues, but it's like Naito Same side of the coin. Naito ain't got enough legs left to, to do it at a high level, and Moxie is a character first person to get you to care about the matches, and then like he does the stuff does what he does, and that carries the match over. And, like, you didn't feel that watching Dynamites building up to this. Like, if you were someone that – even if you were someone that was watching, you know, their the title feud, it was like you didn't necessarily be like, oh, yeah, it's super heated. This is this feels like, you know, Hangman and Moxley, or this feels like Hangman and Punk, or this feels like – I'm sorry, uh, Moxley and Punk, or this feels like Moxley – in uh Omega, it didn't feel like that, or when he or said he Omega was gonna... or, or, or Moxie in Jericho, it didn't feel like none of that. When he said he was gonna end Naito's career, it kind of felt so out of character, like kind of like out of place. It was like, hold on, how did it get to this level? Like, you yeah, gotta end this man career, it's a far jump, <laughs> yeah. Like, like, yeah, I mean, and I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see what's next for Moxley, uh, but he, but you know. I now have I now have questions and wondering like if he's not the focal point, 
does he work? Does he does he work as optimally? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. like is it like a James Harden thing? Like either you either you give him, either you hand him the keys to every the keys to the top to handle everything, and is at a high level for a long time, or if he's a bit player, can he adjust? Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought this match was, yeah, pretty bad. I, I saw the first match in Chicago for Windy City Riot. Um, right. And, you know, that wasn't the you know the greatest match in the world either, but right. that match was better. Uh, the crowd, I'll say that was a New Japan crowd. They were there for that match. They were there for Naito yep. versus Mox, and they were really into that match. And uh, there was this aura. And just, and that match that, that on that night felt important. And even though it again it wasn't a five star you know IWGP Classic like it it felt like two top stars fighting for a top championship there was a you know a strong kind of personal issue and challenge there Mox has been chasing you know this title for a while now and I felt like that match ended up being better and then yeah we get here and again I think we just saw kind of the bad chemistry at display I mean before the match even started I looked at all the guys in the room I was like how many times is Naito going to spit on John Moxley, and we had a yep. spit count throughout it, the it, match. The over or Josh, uh, Josh two, not not Josh keeping strong cell. Like he, I think he put over under at three and a half, right? Yeah, something like that. Mm. Yeah, uh, and we all pushed the over. Yeah, and, and he did. I think it was like, like eight or nine times that he he spit on him, and yeah. like we didn't even it's get just a goal. Yeah, like, <laughs> that, I just keep coming back to it. It's dull, like and like they they had a few things here, like when Naito went up for the for the top rope run and got turned into a, to, into the super power bomb. I was like, oh okay, I don't, I can't remember last time I seen Naito get power bomb in that position. Like there were things here, it just it didn't meld well enough. It just didn't. And yeah. we've seen we've seen Moxley, you know. We've seen Moxley in New Japan enough in that G1 run, like to know that like he does naturally, he he can naturally fit like a, like very well with with people. This just wasn't one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Naito, he he's he's washed, and it sucks because he he's the top draw right now for New Japan. It's kind of hard not to go with him because you you gotta draw these houses, you, you gotta you gotta make money. The, the end is down, but. Unfortunately, he he's a top guy, and you, you got to go with him. Hey, Keith, <laughs> legs, feet, you know, got to make sure. So, see, at first I thought you scratched like it's uncomfortable that he said wash, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, he he's, yeah, he's doing washed. He's washed up. Okay, Let's yeah, and all and also too, it's another uh, thing of you know, New Japan fail to prepare for the future and get young guys ready. We've been saying this for on keeping a strong style for weeks now. You know they. They were eating. They were eating well when you had Kenny Omega and Okada and Will Those Ospreay. Were the worst days, Jeremy. They were the worst days. <laughs> they they were eating well, and now they're they're all gone. And like they 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 failed to get Umin already. They failed to get Suji ready. Who knows what the heck they're doing with U- Uomura? Uh, you know, I mean, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be ready in three years. That, that's three years too late. We need them ready now. <laughs> I know that, but they but they act like they don't know that. Right. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how you can be encouraged. Like, if, if like, you know, Tetsuya Naito is like, has his belt right. And it's like, I don't know how you can be encouraged by this and be like, yeah, this is exciting still. What it's block like, is evil in? It's the same, same one. Same block. They, 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 they still haven't done that match. I think they're going to do it this year in the second half of the year. Yeah, I'm thinking that too. The, the A block is the, the LIJ block. You have Naito, Evil, Sonata, and Chingo. All in there. Wow. <sighs> wow. Um, yeah, man. It it is a uh it's tough because like this guy's not the 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 guy and then I heard Jim Ross on commentary just just going overboard like, yeah, man, these are two of the best wrestlers in the world and all this other shit. I'm like, I don't agree. Like <laughs> Like, like it don't look like it. Like, like even well, if that is the case, right? You know, okay, it, it so, don't look like it. My so, eyes are telling me something else. You know, we watch the New Japan on Access stuff when Ross is calling it, and I think one of the few things that Ross gives credibility to is when he would come out here, in the, especially the first two years, he would come out here and he would talk glowingly about Okada. And Tanahashi and talk about how the, the level of esteem he holds them in as in ring performers. 
I thought that gave credence to to justify him being on there. But we've also heard him call Naito matches, and we know he does not actually hold Naito to that level of regard. So I was like, I see what they're trying to do, but like, is Ross actually going to tell the lies to 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 do the, to put Naito over in that way? And then like, he really didn't. And I was like, oh. Okay, and then the match happened like, oh, <laughs> it was trying to oh, cover it up. This, 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 this feels, feels kind of strange, strange man. Here, and, you know, <laughs> yeah, this feels kind of strange. And all this other shit. Yeah, man. Yeah, it was rough. Uh, we had some questions here. Uh, Rambone says, "Was it a mistake to have Naito working all the tours instead of taking a break to rest and heal up while Mox held a title? He looks rougher than normal, and the meat grinder of the G One is looming." I think it goes back to my point earlier. He's the top draw. You you can't have Naito not be on these tours, even if he has to be in a multi man. Like you have to put him in on these shows. Maybe he can just cut up, come out and cut a promo or something. Do do a roll call in every city. <laughs> so I'm coming to do the roll call, you know. And then he, but he don't actually work a match. Naito is going to do the roll call. call. Be there, correct. <laughs> I will call out <laughs> Bushi, Kisan, Shingo, Hiromu. Bring y'all ass out. <laughs> Actually, stay there because the roll call apparently is something else that I I didn't think you know. L I J Ha Bone in every city. Now, now that you said this for for now uh, all year, I'm I'm starting to wonder if like. Do you think like the, the LIJ roll call was like the little John the East Side Boys real nigga roll call and everybody was to come out? Yes. <laughs> it's not. Yes. That's what I yes. thought. I was like, when I hear a roll call, I'm like, bro, all right. Play, <laughs> play Shingo's music. Bring his ass out here. And then they all get in the ring. They put their hands on the circle. They, they say LIJ. They, 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 they point at the crowd. They all get in different corners like and, and raise, raise the roof. And, you know, almost like a curtain call. Correct, and then they play the Naito superhero music, and then they walk out the dome. They take a picture at the top of the fucking uh, joint, and then everybody takes their ass home. That's what I thought the roll call was, but apparently it is not the real new roll call. Apparently, oh man. <laughs> uh, Let's commission seven seven two five two says with Naito's sloppy performance on Sunday, it shows he doesn't have much more in the tank to be the guy to carry New Japan unless it's in merch or the popularity of Lij. Is it a bad move to have him headline next year's Wrestle Kingdom at the state that he's in right now? My idea for him is to lose to Zack in G1, lose to him on his first offense. If Umino wins the G1, you can have Zack versus Umino at Wrestle Kingdom in the main event. Whether you two disagree or agree, you guys think Moxie and Umino are capable enough to main event next year for the belt. So I would get the idea that Zack and Shota could as well. Man. Unfortunately, like that's not the world we live in. Like, as right. far as like, it's always nice to look down the road, but wrestling companies have trouble putting guys out to pasture, especially when there's money to make in buildings to fill. Yep. Yeah. I I just don't think it is. I don't think it'll be anything short of um, malpractice to put someone put two people in the main event of the Tokyo Dome and one of them's not Naito at this stage right now. I think I think that you know like what Jeremy in your opinion what is the very best singles match that New Japan could put in the main event of Tokyo Dome this year? Uh um, on January 4th, 4th 2025. I would say either Naito and Zack or Naito and Shingo. Probably. Not not so not Shingo and in, in, in Saber. Uh well, I mean if you're, if you're saying leave Naito out, no, no 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 no. Regard if you were trying to put on the best match you possibly could, you trying to get the six stars or whatever the fuck, seven stars, eight stars, whatever the best you trying to have the match of the year from New Japan roster. What is what are you putting in in the Tokyo Dome main event? Yeah, it'd probably be Shingo and Saber. Yeah, they're the two top workers. They have incredible chemistry. That that would I, be right. You you can't do that. They can't they can't get away with that. And that and it's just that's where they are. Like Trying to push no, the button on Tomohiro Ishii. <laughs> yeah, it, the, the hard. Thing I mean, is, if you want a great if you want a great Naito match, you can always do Ishii and Naito in the dome. Sure. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, hard thing, Josh. What you, what you say, Rich? 
I said, I'm with you, Josh. <laughs> the hard thing is, again, is all packs points back to Naito being a draw. You know, if this was, you know, it's not like an e booking game where you, you can kind of pick what you want. You know, there's a, a journey, a wrestling game where you can right. kind of book your stuff. I did a, I did a, a, a Zach Umino main event. It got uh, five and a half stars. Umino won, became a new face of the company. Like, like that, like that can't. All, that's not always going to happen. Like it's, it's you, fantasy you, land, right? <laughs> you you got to book something that's going to draw, and then hopefully it, it's great as well. And so I have yeah. a hard time seeing Naito not be in the Tokyo Dome main event. Uh, I, I think it's it's probably going to be. I don't know. I have a hard time because to me, all the guys I would say should face Naito are all in the same block as him. Shingo, Umino, and Zach are all in the A block. Um, and traditionally, you know, a lot of times the winner comes from the opposite block, which makes me think, you know, Suji could be that kind of dark horse to win. And you, I, th- I think with Wrestle Kingdom being on a Saturday, you can you can swing a Suji versus Naito main event. Uh, I think that would be a great thing to kind of get Suji up and running. Um, but again, I don't know if they want to go that route of having a more established a Zach or a Shingo. I mean, there. It, it would it would be a very good story given you know that you know what happened in, in when he got the title shot after winning winning New Japan Cup. It, it would be a nice story of something besides Sonata or Evil. I was about to say we ain't going back to Sonata. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> oh man. Uh, Please no. Please no. <laughs> MJ asks, he says, I'd say this is a, as a big Naito fan. Brother is washed. He's half a step ahead of Tanahashi in physical c- capability. I worry he's going to get hurt. So he's going to hurt someone in the ring. What's the succession plan for their biggest draw? Let go and let God deal with it. Because I, 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 why don't I, they do Naito and Hiromu? Because they refuse to move him up to main to to heavyweight. That's the best drawing match you could do. Yeah, like th- that would be it. And then just beat Hiromu. It, like you clearly want to keep it on Naito. Have him Bro, beat Hiromu and then they, like figure it out. Been, beat him beat him the next night at Wrestle Dynasty. That match has been in the chamber since the an- the 2020 anniversary show, right? Yeah. God damn, Zach. <laughs> you never did it. <laughs> Zach said Yikes. let Naito go like Masawa. Oh no! Yikes! Can't do that. Masawa didn't have no choice on that. <laughs> Zach, you you are a sick man with nasty that agenda. Is crazy. Oh man! So, uh, any uh, any other final thoughts here on Naito and Moxley? That's never want to see them wrestle each other again. Yeah, never want to see it again. Um, yeah, Tessa and Naito. How Dustin Rose say, keep stepping like that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, keep stepping. FOH this year. We, we, we might need to throw Naito <laughs> on the board. Nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, look, y'all don't want me to get drunk and talk about this to your nights. So no, do y'all not. don't want that. I do not. Uh, oh. <laughs> like me and Jeremy do enough editing as it is. <laughs> Oh man, that'll be the special, you know, uncut. You pay extra, <laughs> get the, the rich rant on Naito. Oh, oh my god! Oh man! All right, well, guys, we only got one match left here, and it, it was probably the, the best match of the night: the AEW World Title Match. Swerve Strickland defeats Will Osprey in twenty-seven minutes and six seconds. One of the very best matches of the year. Um, I, you know, just going back real quick, I think a part of the reason that her, or one of the things that hurt crowd reaction to Naito in Moxley was I think people also wanted to get to the main event too. Um, this was the best built thing in AEW. Um, it is two people that have been racing each other at the top of the company. One person got to the title first. One person just was getting their feet wet in the company in spectacular matches. Uh, one person spent uh, the last half of last year facing one of the p- or cornerstones of the company and beating them and p- making himself into a main eventer. And the proof is shown in like 
this is a the this is the essence of AEW when people say when they came up with the, the line like we're the best wrestle. The best wrestle and the best wrestle each other in high leverage, high stakes moments, and they put on great matches, and someone gets their gets pinned and someone loses, and they'll see each other again. But like somebody is but the idea is to make two stars instead of just one when you can. Um, and I thought this accomplished that. This cemented uh, Swerve's title reign. And this also, for me, cements like Will Ospreay is going to have an incredible chase to get this title. And it's going to be, it's going to feel so rewarding when he finally gets to it. And, um, you know, me and Rich were talking about this early in the year, like the way this is going. And while, you know, people like uh, Dave Meltzer was like, hey, he's the best wrestler in the world, put the belt on him. Six months in, it's like, nah, man. There's more. There's more. There's more to this than just going straight to that. Like, this is a pretty, you know, consistent, or you know, in general, a pretty good, you know, run of booking at the top from Tony Khan. Trust that he's going to pull through on this one. Trust that, like, what you saw with Hangman and Swerve. And, and and swerve in the uh kind of classic is real the momentum is real people want to see him win people want to want to see this like listen to the crowd reaction this wasn't just this was 50 50 this was the crowd chanting for osprey and chanting for swerve and at the end the person that's champion gets their biggest win uh with the title you can take off your asterisks of mr transitional championship whatever assumptions you had you were wrong and also, for those that also <laughs> thought that for a different reason, you should also feel like a dumbass because it made no fucking sense that Will Ospreay was going to, a British guy, was going to win the top title a month before the biggest show they have of the year in London, England. It was, it was, it made no sense for people to think it was going to happen, but people thought it was happening. Like, I understand there's a lot of goofy shit that goes on with AEW. It's like any other rest promotion. Things fall through the cracks. That ain't something falling through the cracks. Cracks. That is something falling in a sinkhole to the into the earth's mantle, into the core. Like no, so it didn't happen. Everything makes sense, and they tr- they went with the idea of a hey, let's try to make two stars instead of one, or cementing two stars instead of one. And I think they accomplished that. And I thought this was one of the best match of the year. And I, you know, I love the match and um, I can't wait to rewatch it. And I'd rarely watch anything these days. Um, Five stars. Absolutely. Um, This was, as James mentioned, like the race to the spot with these guys. Um, I felt like Swerve was by far the most over person on the show. Like this match, the reaction to it, the aftermath, the execution of the match was all proof of the hot, solid feud that they built with each other with very traditional means. You have something I want. I'm protecting something from you. I am basically uh, going to exploit part of a weakness of you that you don't know you have yet. With you know the the thing with with Osprey's like mentality, Swerve's gonna make it personal. They did a lot of angles on this thing. Swerve cut a lot of great promos in the lead up to this thing. Osprey cut a lot of great promos leading up to this thing to like make you make you believe in them. And this is just like when you think about the best AEW uh, title matches of all time, this is right at the top, baby. Like this is um, and, and, you know a lot of people are saying this is a definitive win for Swerve uh, for you know his you know his title reign, and we we know. The suckers, the hoes, the lames that that was talking down, you know, that 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 was thinking it was a game that thought he was coming off it in two months, you know, that we're going to make the hangman program mean nothing if we just yanked it from him just because, you know, five star match man go boom, you know, the line go up, you know, like the thing with Will Ospreay, this guy is the most sensational wrestler in the game. There's no, there's no taking away from him. There's no denying it. There is much more room to get something out of him over 18 months than it would be over six months. This is just math, really. And on One Nation Radio, we we tend to embrace math, not reject it. <laughs> like <laughs> when you make more money off throughout the the long run of this thing, and like 
still keep you know you, you, what Swerve has going. Like you use Osprey to build Swerve up and like give like like Swerve like the bigger star in the world last night. He looked like Flair Thez last night. Like it, it looked like the way he w- was operating. Like came out new gear or whatever, huge entrance. Like and then like you see, it was like he was leaping off the screen. Like it was like. Of course, this is the fucking champion. Like that's that's what it like when I saw them in the ring together. I think it might have taken a lot of people time to realize it was like, oh, this is not some like walk or a lay down for Osprey. Like they're just thinking like Osprey's just so much more over than everybody. He's not, at least in the case with Swerve. Like Swerve's over as fuck. So it's like like Swerve was so over that the person that the promotion was built around in their chase, they turned him heel no more one. Like to think that so, so people to come around and be like after seeing what's happened over the three matches between Adam Page and Swerve, right? And their feud since uh Russell Dream to you know uh Dynasty or not Dynasty but uh, Revolution to think that like Will Ospreay was gonna come in and the crowd was going to love him inside of six months to the point where like they have to they just have to change his title. Was, like it was always it always was a head scratcher to think that I don't give a damn how good Osprey is, and I think he's the best wrestler worker in the world. No. Yeah, and, and it's like when when you look at it like this, just enhances what Swerve has going on. Obviously, you know he's done well like with the wrestling. Uh, you know he's got four defenses already. This is going to be uh, eleven thousand uh, paid house. This is going to be a uh, million dollar gate. Th- that, those go under under his drawing record right there. So like this is like such an important thing I think to take notice of. And a lot of people either didn't want it to happen. They rooted against it. They didn't understand um, the direction it was heading. They have psychoanalyzed Swerve being the champion uh, for reasons of him being black. Um, They have psychoanalyzed this thing from him being compared to other people with championships. It's like, no, this guy's something new. You just got to take the ride. You got you got to sit there with it, even if it ends at Wembley Stadium. Even if it ends, like you know, after that. You got to look at like what has happened so far. It's like he's stamped forever right now. Like this is like how you turn somebody into somebody that will always be valuable for you. You talk about AEW, right? And what those letters activate inside of wrestling fans. This guy, Swerve Strickland, embodies that shit. Betting on yourself, like like taking your doing things your way, presenting your character the way you want to present it, and it getting over and it working, and he's bringing it. Uh, the Jim Jones thing that was cool. Whole arena singing, we've uh, like that. You know, Jim Jones is like not new or anything, but it's just like yo, that's it's Jim Jones that's coming out and introducing Swerve, and I believe they did like a gym workout video that's gonna drop uh sometime this week possibly. So it's like Swerve is doing so many things beyond just your normal world champion to where it's like you got to keep running with this guy it was the right decision it was a fucking classic match just so many like oh so many incredible athletic feats that only these two guys are going to pull off like the hurricane on the outside all the reversals like even the fucking don cal shit didn't bother me it was just like all right whatever and then he just cleaned them up beat them clean anyway so like I have like, I'm so impressed with this. Like, and largely, like, you know, I try to stay like, like, I don't want to know what's happening. Like, I I just kind of want to watch it or whatever. Obviously, anybody who's listened to this show knows I'm really good friends with Swerve and stuff like that. But I'm like, you know, I send them the the, the motivational messages before the pay per views, stuff like that. And when I see these shits pay off, it's like, I trust no one else more than him right now. To, to make this shit ride. Yeah. I mean, this is exactly what AW needs. Uh, th- this uh, this kind of main event. We need more of two top guys having a personal issue wanting to prove that they are the best wrestler in the world and going out and doing it. I feel like that was the essence of what AW was built upon, and I think over the years they've kind of slid away from that, and I think this is exactly what this show needed, what the main event needed. And that just proves you like how hot this match was. Like the crowd was locked in for this match. You know, people complain, Oh, the show is so long. People by the end of the show, they're not, they're going to be tired. 
Yeah, it didn't matter. They were. It's the same four hour fucking show, people. Sorry, sorry, Jeremy. No, you're good. No, it, it, but yeah, so they, they were locked in to this main event. The crowd was there, and this is what you need. You need emotional buy in to top guys. And, you know, you're probably looking at three of the big, biggest Will Ospreay fans out there. We've seen Will live so many times. You know, we were there, uh, you know, New Orleans uh, weekend, uh, New York weekend, where he's, you know, opening one show, main eventing another show. He's doing a, a, a mid card match, another show, like running. Seeing him ride by and jump in cars and shit and drive off. Yeah, literally jump out of one Uber to go to one building and then jump in the Uber to go back to another building. Like, he's incredible. And, and I get it. Like, I love Will. And I know there's a lot of people, you know, Tom Talk Hall, the special guy, they, they wanted Will to win this match or thought he was going to win and go into Wembley as champion. And as you point out, James, I guess it didn't make sense from a booking standpoint to have him win. But I do think that they did a great job of building Will up to the point where people are like, oh, he's on a hot streak. He can win. Maybe he defends the belt in Wembley instead of winning it. You know, he's 18 and 0 going into the match. I thought they did a great job at least heating Will up. And there's people who still yeah. going in this match or thinking, I saw on Twitter, oh, yeah, Will's winning 100%. No way, Swerve's winning. And, you know, surprise, surprise, you know, Swerve gets a big win here. And I think that people underestimate how much Swerve has been built up, how much work he has done. Like, great example you mentioned, James, like the whole Hangman Page feud. Like, Hangman, one of the top baby faces of the whole promotion. That would be like if somebody turned Hogan heel in the in the eighties when he and he was on his hot bay face run. Somebody came in that was so hot and like could, could turn Hogan heel in the midst of that hot bay face run. Like it was they, Austin and Brett. Swerve, look, man, Swerve. Yeah, right. Right. Like Swerve got that look, Swerve got that man at the house drinking again. Yeah. And the crowd loves him. Like he has a connection because of this, you know, coming in Willing to willing to work with anybody, seemingly, doing a tag thing, one of the best tag team runs with the belt, and then you know the run towards this. Like this was this was all you know, this is all like just a crowning achievement. It's a crowning achievement, and like we don't know if this is the end of the crowning achievement. It's like we'll see, but like there was clearly like somebody picked somebody saw something in him and decided to go a direction with it. And like, this was all put together over that time. Very, very fucking well in a way that like you almost can't even predict things going that well because of how he performed, how his opponents uh, reacted to him, how, how these things came together. Like we're, I think we're gonna look back in time. Be like, Hey, Hey man, Swerve is like one of the most successful programs like uh, as far as uh critically in major american history pro wrestling history because it's like and then think about the time that it started like it started during a time where the promotions in chaos yep like there's an argument that this feud turned the promotion around like and basically got us to like move on from all the foolishness that was happening mm -hmm. or at least made it to where like you can watch and not feel like you have to think about that in the back of your head you just watch it again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, man, like, I just think that, like, Swerve now, like, he has two, he has two rivals now. He has two rivals. Like, it will be a time where Osprey wins this thing and he will, he will get a, a, a win back from Swerve. There will be a time where he has to see Hangman again. And I think, uh, Rich was talking about this one, like, the Willow and Mercedes thing was happening. It's like, this is going to be about like the chase for Willow, and then she and then she's going to see Mercedes again, and she's going to get the win over Mercedes. It's going to feel so satisfying because you went through, you know, that. But this is on the higher level because like this is the main event, and like this swerve has been around in your face for a lot longer uh, than Mercedes has been in AEW. You know what I mean? Like it just she's been. It's just it just there's so much more weight to it emotionally. Or as a person is a, as watching this as a pastime, and yeah, um, I can't wait to see where Swerve goes with this. I obviously, I think you know, blunt guts, obviously, um, against the elite. Uh, I can't wait to see what this what this thing is when Hangman comes back. I can't wait to see what Osprey goes. It could be MJF, whatever, going to Wembley. But like, I think we're pretty set for like a really solid, you know, 
um, summer in Wembley, of course, uh, all in, of course. So yeah, like I, I thought this main event, regardless of this not being a, sh- a show of the decade contender, like the first two um, Forbidden Doors were, like by the end of this match happens, I see the Shingo match, I get the ladder match. I'm like, hey man, this wasn't this wasn't one of the greatest shows of all time, but this was still a great show. Yeah, and like it, it you know, I, I and at this point, you know. Will Osprey is Mr. Forbidden Door. Yeah. He's Mr. Forbidden yeah. Door. Yeah. And um Absolutely. I don't matter how many how many of these we gonna have in the future, whatever else. This is his pay-per-view. Yeah. 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 This is a really inc- incredible match. We didn't really talk about all the spots in the match. I mean, there's just so much there's so many. So, so much, many. So much oh. great stuff um in the match. And uh, just the opening sequence when they're exchanging moves after the bell rings. This is like, all right. Like this is this is what we came here for. Bell and, pop, yes, bell pop. Uh, crowd behind both guys. Incredibly, you, we mentioned the hurricane on a spot on the floor. Uh, swerving the pile driver on the the uh, barricade. Yep. Um, Osprey trying to go with the I call it the uh, the super uh, the shingo finisher that he did at the Super Junior Finals, where he does yeah. the super os cutter and then uh, holds and it, it and goes back up. Go yeah. for the uh, for the uh, stormbreaker. Stormbreaker. Yeah. Yeah. Swerve kicks out the swerve. For a near fall. Yeah. I don't think many people kicked out with Stormbreaker. Maybe Okada, maybe, but yeah, that's a super protected move, and and they tied in the whole the uh, Storm Driver, uh, Tiger Driver story as well. You had the whole Don Cal story. Like this match hit on so many different beats, so many different levels. It accomplished so many different things. It, it established Swerve as the dominant world champion that will do what it takes to win his title. And then also we got this. You know, we're gonna. In the next chapter now, this whole Will Ospreay, Don Callis story, we're finally probably going to get that breakup, hopefully eventually, and that's probably going to play into what's going to happen at Wembley and potential rumors of you know United Empire coming back together with Kyle Fletcher and Mark Davis when he comes back from injury. There's so much stuff there that they're going to do with both of these guys, and I think the booking is so laser-focused right now going into Wembley. Um, we were getting like matches announced for Dynamite and Collisions and Rampage like we haven't had in a while now, and... Uh, we got the beach break coming up this Wednesday. We got blood and guts coming up. We got Wembley coming up. It seems like right now that there's a plan. There's a focus. There's there's got there's certain people that are trying to build up and swerve is at the forefront of that. And people they're gonna have to recognize that like this he's a, he's a top star. He is established main eventer. This world title run has solidified him. He's a guy you can always go back to. I know AEW is not. As hot as it was a few years ago, but you look at Swerve's quarter hours, he, he's been drawn very well. Uh, he's having great matches, and he's definitely become a reliable guy. And I think it's going to be interesting to see kind of what where his trajectory continues to go uh, as stuff moves forward. A lot and of people I, had, I, had, to, had, to, had to shut the fuck up, honestly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, I, and, to, and to be honest, right, just skeptically, right, knowing the history of American, American pro wrestling, like, I can see why you arrived at the conclusion that Swerve's transitional champion. This bucked that trend. Mm-hmm. And quite honestly, thanks. <laughs> like this should this should not be the like this should not be the thing where it's like, oh, this guy's doing great quarter hours. Oh, this guy has one of the greatest feuds in the history of the company. Oh, this guy had a feud of the year contender last year. Oh, this guy's having great a great title run, great matches is carrying the promotion narratively uh, more or less by himself in a way that few people ever have. Let's say the belt off in two months. Yeah. Why? Well, I think so to get the belt taken off him in two months because the history of people that look like him and everywhere else over, over a hundred years in this, in, in this fake sport, like that fucking sucks. I'm glad this happened. Yeah. 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 So it- yeah, there's I, that. I, like, <laughs> I I can't wait to see um what what all the final uh, numbers look like for the pay per view buys and everything because this like when I think about what I want AEW to be, I want it to be Swerve versus Will Osprey. I want it to be in this style, you know, guys going at each other like in their primes, um, doing business, uh, and you know, I it just seems like we're set for like a special time with like. The, the the guys that they have around like and you add to Kesha in the mix you add hangman in the mix like like there's just there's so many like great matches that are right there and 
I don't know, man. A lot of people don't don't like this company for whatever reason and shit like that. But it's like, look at the wrestlers, man. Like, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> like it's just too much, man. It's it's too much. Yeah, it's 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 incredible wealth a talent. Yeah. Uh, Sir Sam said, "Amazing night for Swerve. Felt like the hugest deal." When do you think TK put put his trust in Swerve and realized he could be the guy? Uh, want me to go first? Yeah, you can go first. Swerve in our glory. Yeah, I think that's probably a, a good starting point there. That, like that, that, that team got over. Where, what was the match that went off? The first yeah. match. Uh, all out 2022. Yep, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's I think that's the genesis for um you know the like the story of Swerve Strickland obviously starts like Revolution 2022, but chapter one like <laughs> is right there in that match. It's like, oh, like this guy is clearly the MVP of this match. Like, and you know, when when I look at the team just on itself, it seemed like the team was kind of designed to spotlight Keith Lee. This could have been all right. Keith Lee's. Right, whatever. like it, se- it seemed like you know they, they did the whole Shaq Kobe thing, and now it's supposed to be ominous. It was like, oh, the back, the person that's going to stab the back is going to be Kobe, right? And then it just, you know, it didn't it didn't work out that way, which yeah. actually ended up being a benefit that it didn't turn into just that obvious. Yeah, and then like after that, it's like you know, sort of floated for a little bit, but. I think what happened was Swerve realized he could he came to Tony Khan with value. He 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 was like, "Yo, I, I have something that I can provide you while this you know weird time is happening in the company. You know, while Collision's getting off the ground, while Punk and all that shit and everything else. Like, yo, like go- Booking's getting goofy. You know, you're, a lot of people aren't losing clean. Like, he's like, yo, I'm gonna give you great matches and I'm gonna lose clean and be like a good soldier." So, like, the summer of 2023, like, or the spring into the summer was also a huge uh, part in gaining Tony Khan's trust. And it was like, all right, we've given you this. You've done well with it. We've given you this. You've made this person look good. All right, we're going to we're gonna test you in this Hangman Page feud. And then you put out one of them. You write your ticket after that. Yeah. I mean, also, I'd also point out, like, the stuff he was doing with A.R. Fox, Nick Wayne, and Dark was also, like, for, for a mid-card thing, that was really well done. Um, it also really didn't work out because of the stupid visa thing, but, yeah. yeah. I feel like that, that, that Wembley match, too, uh, maybe it wasn't the starting point, but I feel like... Put his ass in the casket. Put it, Being in there with Sting and Darby, and I think you, said, you mentioned, Rich, like, how Sting kind of really got some respect for Swerve. Yeah. After that match, I probably I feel like that was another kind of foundational moment of all right, like Swerve can be in there, he can take care of a guy like Sting. There's heat there with him and Darby, like that was a great moment there. And then also we've, we've talked about the Hangman feud, um, like that was also uh, I think probably the the big solidifier there of like all right, we can get yep. this guy in a money program that draws um, and that's going to uh, you know kind of captivate the audience. Like that's that's one of the biggest feathers in Hangman Page's caps cap ever. Like yeah. he made he helped make a guy. Yeah. Unquestionably. You know, you see him punk fans. Sorry, man. <laughs> like, sorry. Like, I, I look, I like seeing Punk still. The whole thing about he's an empty headed dumb fuck. No. <laughs> no, <laughs> categorically wrong. He, you know, he, like when that hill turn happened early beginning of this year, he did Bret Hart better than the Bret Hart merchants. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, so that's uh, Forbidden Door Swerve. He gets the the win over Will Osprey. Celebrates him and Prince Nana. Uh, you know, he shows respect to Will after the match. That was a big deal there to kind of establish like, all right, Swerve is still. A, a baby face, but you know, in the match, it, you know, he had to go to work. Now the bell's over. Like we can, we can be boys again. You, you did a great job, Will. And so, the next chapter of that's going to come with Will, and he's got Daniel Garcia uh, this coming Wednesday on Beach Break for the international title. So we'll see where that goes from there. Um, we had a question here from Stale Burger Bun. Judging by the Forbidden Door results, which current NJPW guys are getting signed by Tony next? 
Oh, uh, this is what we doing. We were, we're really going into the, into the nasty work that like that that quickly. Paper pay per view ain't even been over for like twenty four <laughs> hours. Maybe that's where we're going straight to. Still Who's next to be plundered? Still burger bun. Uh, uh, a uh, a negative that's messy man. As hell. Hey, negative man. I, I seen you working the forum, sir. Hey, negative man. Oh man. Not playing with you. Yeah, on, on Observer, Tony Khan sounded very high on Suji, so Yeah, he did. Yeah, that man sounded like he was real familiar with Suji. How about that? Look, y'all want it look, you want to get nasty? I'll get nasty too. How about Yoda Suji? You know, how, yeah. how, how about how about Shingo Takagi? Maybe maybe we bring him over next. You know, how about Hiromu Still- Takahashi? You know. Man, yes. <sighs> they do they do that. They may as well even from fuck with Ben Door. It's like, hey man, this, this is just anyway. Uh so out of New Japan, home. right? Out of New Japan, right? I I I mean obviously he loves Saber. Yeah. So I mean, I don't think Sa- I I don't I don't know how Saber's motivated or whatever else. Um, but if he had the opportunity to sign Saber, I think he absolutely would. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. I know one man he is not signing. Tetsuya Naito. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to say evil? <laughs> evil oh. Watanabe. Evil, evil is not a safe. They real safe. Yeah. Y'all yeah. will have them for years to come. <laughs> Fret not keeping a strong style. <laughs> Can we, can we get the evil logo? You know, to keep the strong style. You know, bro, that that. Can, can we get the sonata? What what what, what is it? Uh, you know, something with the ear. You know, we, ear. we need that silhouetted. Yeah. You know, damn. No. Remember, remember the double belt pose after he beat Naito. Yes. Put that in just, the silhouette. Just one of the nastiest photos to ever exist. I remember when that shit. I was like, this can't, this can't be real. I, right. They really did this. This fake. Fake. Oh, Gabe Kid's on the radar too. By the way. Mm. Mm. Oh boy. All right. Well, Jack said, "Please get off my boy Evil." Look, look, look. You, 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 you ride for Evil in public like this? <laughs> hey, uh, had an opportunity to sit next to Dex uh, at Windy City Riot. Great guy. Long, long time commenter on the uh, on the YouTube channel for all the shows. Yes. The yeah. But his love for evil and how to torture was like we got we got we gotta have got to change that up, Dex. I don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah. Oh man. It ain't for me to understand. <laughs> oh man. Well, that that's Forbidden Door, guys. We've uh, reviewed the show. Um for all the keeping a strong style listeners, I'll probably come back uh, later this week with a Donovan Digest on the Patreon to talk about some of the other New Japan stuff that we didn't uh, cover here tonight. But you know, this is our, our Forbidden Door episode, our Keeping a Strong Style One Nation crossover. Uh, you guys have anything you want to plug coming up? Uh, I mean, Rich, anything? Check out the merch site, onelifetimeworldwide.com. You can get your uh, One Nation Radio merch on there. I'll uh, get One Lifetime merch. I want to support my brand and all that. Um, listen to One Nation Radio uh, for sure. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this and, uh, you know, come through. Like, we'd be clowning. You know, we we do the, the late night Monday live stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So after keeping the strong side, you just slide on through to your boys. <laughs> Double header. Yeah, like about uh, normally around this time, we'd be about like maybe like forty five minutes in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the late night. Yeah, but yeah, and uh, you guys who are watching live, yeah, keeping this strong style over on our Patreon, Patreon dot com slash ki strong style. We do the uh, weekly stream there on the IWGP tier. If you're on the grade one, I've been doing a lot of bonus audio in the middle middle of the Dominion Deep Dive series, reviewing every Dominion main event. Episode three came out recently. I'm um, planning on recording episode four this week, 2012, Okada Tanahashi. I'm also doing news updates, uh, Donovan Digest behind there as well. So check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash KI Strong Style. You're going to say something, Rich? Oh no, I'm I'm chilling. All right. Well, yeah, I think well that's going to uh wrap things up. So yeah, make sure you like, comment, subscribe here on our, our YouTube. We are getting very close to uh monetization on here with the YouTube numbers. So 
Hit the subscribe there on YouTube. Uh, Get us to 1K, 1K subscribers. We, we, we need 1K. Yeah. And so, yeah, maybe we'll do some more live stuff on the YouTube as well. Seems like we had a lot of people here uh, on the chat as well. So we'll have to do some more uh, YouTube stuff as well, live for free for you guys as well. Yeah, yeah, that'll, that'll be dope. And, you know, we can, uh, I don't know, we can open up the merch store while it's live. Maybe I'll, like, slash some prices while it's live. <laughs> Fire sale live. Live, let's go. Put that uh, Triple H shirt up. Uh. Oh, my God. <laughs> we do that. Uh, that that's gonna be all timer, baby. Look, <laughs> look, the day I pop up on on the stream, I'm letting y'all know right now. I will pop up on the stream with the new Triple H merch. That's that's you know, it's nasty. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. Well, that's going to wrap it up uh, for James and Rich. I'm Jeremy. You've been listening to Keeping Strong Style in One Nation Radio, and we will catch you guys next time.